Amanda, where did I get shot? And she's like, you got shot in the neck. I'm like, okay. And I started like freaking out a little bit, right? And so like, yeah. Uh, Amanda was like, I need you to look at me. We're going to combat brief together. But I thought oh, this is how I die for sure, mm-hmm. right? And not knowing that none of my rounds are fatal. I didn't know at the time. And I felt like if I looked away from Amanda, yeah, there'd be the Reaper sitting right next to me and that'd be it. This is 56, a Pinellas County Sheriff's Office podcast. I'm Ricky Butler with Laura Sullivan and Ashley Cooley. March 12th, 2023 is a day we are not going to forget anytime soon because that is the day that on a routine canine track, Corporal Aiken and his partner Taco uh, were ambushed by suspect they were searching for and Matt was shot three times, went down. And unfortunately for the suspect, uh, well, Taco was there, number one. And number two, uh, former SWAT guy, former canine handler, former Major League Baseball player, Sergeant Jake Viano was just happened to be uh, not even nearby, but came down to run back up for Matt. Uh, they worked together for a long time and just happened to be there and uh, was able to dispatch the suspect. It was able to, thanks to Taco and being a great partner, and they made a formidable team, put some rounds uh, on target, and the suspect is no longer with us, but Corporal Aiken is, and we are happy to have Matt uh, on the podcast with us today. Uh, we are gonna. We want to know all about you. We've talked a lot about uh, the shooting. The shooting has gotten some incredible coverage and the heroism and the awards and all that. But there's an actual almost 20 year deputy sheriff under all that somewhere that has been uh, mm-hmm. has a great backstory. And we're going to get into that today uh, on this episode. So before we do that, though, Ashley has a question. You've been doing good to about make us all uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah no, remembering. I, I know. Yeah. All right. Question today: If you could be an expert on one thing. Think like the Matrix. It's just downloaded instantly. You know everything inside and out about this subject, this skill, something like that. What would you choose? I had some time to think about this for myself, so you maybe one a minute. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You have you know everything about it. There's no. And you can obviously use it. You know for a career or whatever, like what, you, are, however, you are the however guy. However you right, want to utilize it. That's what I'm thinking, because my first thought was like all about, you know, animal behavior or something, which I'm personally interested in. But then I'm thinking, well, should I know all about finance? Should I know all about language? Something mm-hmm. I can corrupt yeah. to my own benefit. <laughs> well, I mean, I went yeah. there too at first. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Your bumper sticker says you support snake education. I do. I could learn all about uh, how to educate snakes. Right. Educate make sure snakes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, make sure they're educated. Yeah. yeah. We need smarter snakes. Yeah. I'm not going with that for the record. <laughs> um, everybody else go. I, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, I guess like the stock market. Yeah. If you're going to put it all together, because yeah, then you're sought like after, that. and then you have all kinds of resources, and you can do all kinds of crazy things, whatever you want. Yeah. That's a good one. It is. So I could go two ways with this. One, I could go the Ricky way. I want to know <laughs> everything about gambling. What are oh, the odds in roulette? Oh, what are yeah, the odds in Texas? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are the odds in blackjack? Yeah. When to hit, when to fold, right? All that stuff. Yeah. The other way I could go is anything that is something that is so still complex is everything around uh, the brain. Mm. Neurological oh, yeah. stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, why, why is this happening? Or if you knew exactly the pain that you had in your in mm. XYZ, you knew exactly mm-hmm. how to fix it immediately, mm. right? That's, there it is. Yeah. Dang, or you yeah. get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to go stand in front of at a podium in front of a bunch of white coats and cough. That's, the, <laughs> that's this thing. <laughs> yeah, I just thought to a whole audience of people like, Super why do you, interesting. Tell me how you feel. This is why you feel like that. You can't be safe. Next. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't sugarcoat that at all. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I like that. Don't go down the road of medicine. You're, you're screwed the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's got a talk show where he just brings people on and diagnoses them. There you go. Either way, there's money to be made. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. true. I like and it. benefit to people. Yeah. yeah. Laura, are you yeah. there yet? But, yeah, we're all pretty materialistic, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, it's got to be something money making. I don't know. You can't say, I I don't know. What do you got? You got time to think about it, Ashley. I did. Um, At first, I thought maybe it would be one of my hobbies. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I feel like that takes the fun out of that hobby when you know everything about it inside and out. Part of what makes it fun is the learning, is the trial and error. Good point. Um, One thing that I wish I knew everything about, and it's selfish, but I wish I knew everything about cooking. Like how to Mm. put things together that will, I'm a picky eater. And I would like to be able to eat much healthier and know how to make like the best combinations of things without even thinking about it. Just 
boom, it's there just it natural for me. And I just got it figured out and I can focus on the rest of my life. Interesting. And you can so. make money with that too. You could. We are all material that we're focused on money. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, I wasn't focused on money. I'm focused on me, well, though. <laughs> but, I'm, but, but, but I'm just saying, because I said, oh, you can make money. Well, if you know everything there is to know about anything, you can make money, probably. This is true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have your, so, your own cooking uh, show. Unless you want to know everything about <laughs> not making money. Oh, yes. That's Steve Perky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna go back to, uh, yeah, I'm going to go back to animal behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I went, you, like, like, like. Where, where, sh- where eels go to reproduce, that kind of thing. What would you do the with The mysteries that? of life. Well, like teaching or? <laughs> no, yeah. that's a thing. Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> that was good. That was a good one. Yeah. All right. Matt, um, where'd you grow up? Where'd you come from? Uh, grew up in Jersey. I was born and raised I'm in New so Jersey. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. so I haven't here, been I mean, there. I've just, I've just heard. Did you know yeah. the situation? No. Okay. That's a good no, trigger, so, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. so you have to address Jersey. Jersey is split in two. North Jersey and South Jersey, they're two different states. And where is the split? Like midway? Uh, probably Trenton. Is that in the middle? Jersey City, Trenton. Okay. Yeah. Uh, both areas are uh, gross. Right. <laughs> but so, <laughs> so North Jersey, that's your garden state, right? Jersey is mm-hmm. known as the garden state. That's North Jersey. South Jersey, uh, dirty South Jersey. Uh, it's a great place to be from. Uh, to be from Jersey, Jersey makes you hard. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good spot to grow up. Um, I was born in uh, Collingswood. Um, and so Jersey has all these small little cities and townships. Uh, and every single township and city has their own uh, police department. So I was born in Collingswood, but then I did most of my um, adolescent years in Haddon Heights. So Haddon Heights had their own uh, police department. I think they had like seven officers. <laughs> and so, but every other uh, municipality or township had their own police department of like seven or eight cops, you know? So it's, it's, uh, not like this, um, like country Southern small town, but very similar to that because everyone went to the same market in Haddon Heights. Everyone knew each other. Mm -hmm. Um, there was one high school to go to outside of a private school. Me and my brother and sister all went to a private school in Haddon Heights. Um, and then in, uh, around right around junior high, I moved to Cherry Hill. Okay, so you have a brother and sister. Are you the, where do you fall? Are you the oldest, youngest, middle? I am the youngest. Okay. I'm the youngest. Um, They both still live up north. Okay. Um, My brother is, he was a um, firefighter paramedic for 13 or 14 years. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of time spent in Trenton. So, um, like, in the worst trauma issues he could probably face. Mm Mm-hmm. And then uh, I moved down here in 2005. Okay. Went to the academy at the end of 05, got hired in 06. And then just over time, I had better stories than my brother. So, <laughs> so he, uh, he left fire and uh, paramedic and he got hired by Temple University uh, Campus Police. Oh, okay. But Temple is in, I believe, West Philly, which is a really bad part of Philly. Mm. Uh, I used to work at the University of Pennsylvania at the hospital because my dad was an administrator there. And so I worked there... Um, prior to moving down here, just doing like patient transport. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was decent money and hanging out in the hospital and everyone knew me because everyone knew my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's back up a little bit. So yeah. did you get in trouble when you were a kid? No, not no. at all. Um, really, because I watched my brother and sister get in trouble, so mm-hmm. I knew what not to do. Mm-hmm. Um, or how to not get caught. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, not get yeah. caught is a better way yeah, to find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, was, I mean, I was pretty good. I was a pretty good kid. Um, probably around uh, high school going into college when I kind of like what? started wanting to do my own thing. But right. um School was tough for me. Uh, I really had to work at school to get, get good grades. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny because uh, I tell people this all the time, especially uh, um, like some of the young, younger guys that I know that want to go to the academy or trying to think of what they want to do, um, like the Killian boys. You know, mm-hmm. I'm really close to the Killian family. You know, all through high school and even my first couple of semesters in college, I just didn't go. You know, my, mm-hmm. my dad paid for all these credits and I would just rather party than go to college, you know, go to mm-hmm. class, whatever. And then when I made the decision that, you know, I'm, I'm going to move down to Florida and I'm going to go to the police academy and I'm going to, I'm going to make something out of this. I got a 4.0 all through college. Mm-hmm. It was easy. And it's, once it, you're motivated. Once you're motivated. Yeah. And the college was, it was just stupid easy. It's like, how did I not do well with this? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, uh, even high school. You're thinking like, of other things in high school. Maybe, yeah. 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 Just a genius. Yeah. Other plans. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's not get crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. as a kid Wait, though. Wait, but was he a tactical genius? Mm, no, probably been not. there, done yeah, that. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. um, so what were you into when you were a kid? I heard you like to play the drums. I did. Mm. How'd you I, get into that? I played the drums when I was uh, about nine or 10 years old, I started. 
Was there, what, what, I mean, how do you? So I think, I think what started me off on doing that is we had a family friend, uh, his name was Bill Scully. He just passed away a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up with a guy, but he played drums in our church mm-hmm. and he was just a phenomenal drummer. And he, uh, he paved the way to kind of, um, I started playing in church a little bit with him mm-hmm. and then, um, he worked with my dad to find a good drum set for me. And then I was just hooked. And I just, I did that every day until I was about 21, 22. Dang. Drumming every day. So you're probably uh, pretty good. Every day. Yeah, I'd like to think so. we got to get that's a drum good. set in here. I, I feel like that's like a parent's worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So, so, of yeah. all the instruments you can get for your yeah. kid. Yeah. So we were in Cherry Hill. Uh, I mean, I would play hours. I would play till my yeah. hands were bleeding. I mean, it was. Uh, what did you, what did you play? I mean, you just. I played everything. Favorite um, songs where I just crank it out. Just crank it out. I play everything. So I never, I never wanted to be stuck in one genre. I could play anything. Uh, of hip hop to Dave Matthews to metal stuff. I could play anything. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to be, when I first was going through high school, my, my goal was to be a studio drummer. You know, whatever artists come in, I want to play drums for that artist, mm-hmm. whether it be, you know, ballads or heavy metal, whatever it is, I want to play everything. And so mm-hmm. I was, I, and I still have a very uh, eclectic uh, music taste. You know, taste, but, um, but I was in Cherry Hill you know, my drums were in the garage and I had a massive drum set. I had like 17 cymbals. It was insane. Yeah. Yeah. It was like Neil Pert from the Martian. Just, like, just massive, right? Yeah. Just missing the gong, you know? <laughs> but, uh, so Cherry Hill is, uh, it's, it's, it's a traditionally a Jewish neighborhood. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of money and there's a lot of older people <laughs> in Cherry Hill. That's where a lot of the money comes from. Right. And across the street from me and down maybe three or four houses, there was an older couple and they hated me. Mm-hmm. They called the police all the time. And we like, <laughs> we made efforts to soundproof my garage a little bit and the police would come to, to, and they would hear it. And they're like, that's what they complained about. You can barely hear it, you know, but, uh, but my parents were awesome about it. You know, it was never time like, Hey, can we be done? Like mm-hmm. they really supported it. Um, awesome. Yeah. It was really cool. And I got into playing um, a couple of bands and the last band I was in, we did really well. Um, we played uh, a bunch of shows in Philly, um, had a little bit of a following. Some of the bigger um, places that we played at, um, some of the bands that played through there was Train and uh, Switchfoot, mm-hmm. uh, a mm-hmm. uh, place called the North Star and uh, Grape Street Pub. Those were big ones in, in Philly that, that we got the opportunity to play in. Um, and then it started, it started falling apart. And at mm-hmm. some point I'm like, all right, well. What, why did it fall apart? <laughs> Uh, a girl. Yeah, I was going to guess. Yoko, I was going to guess. Yoko got him a tune. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it always happened. Yeah. It always It was so been. funny because like, it was me and one other guy that really started it. And then we started piecing it together with, with other, other people that played. And everyone in the band was very like, uh, like-minded like me. We, we didn't want to fall into one drawner. We could mm-hmm. play anything. Mm-hmm. And the guy who started the band, he was, uh, I don't know if he's still playing, um, but as far as a songwriter, he's extremely talented extremely talented, you know, me and him would write the music, but he was the lyricist and he was incredible. Hmm. Um, but yeah, a girl got between us and it was stupid. And, you know, we didn't talk for the longest time. Then like, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 years after hmm. we hmm. saw each other at a wedding and we were just laughing, we were laughing how stupid it was, yeah. you know? And so like, neither of you got the girl and did you no, remember no, it was her funny Cause or... it was like the time he was like, bro, you saved me. She's a crazy vegan now. And I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> You know, so we, and we always wondered, like, man, what if we just like put kept, that? Kept that yeah. Yeah, what was the name of your side. band? It was Project Hill. Project Hill. Yeah. So we, uh, there were some, uh, some places in Philly we played it was, um, there were some, some bigger places that was really fun to play at. Mm. And it was, and, and it was fun, but, you know, really doing that. And that's your, my, my occupation when I was, was, was working at the hospital, but all of our money went into recording demos and mm-hmm. putting songs out and trying to get a following. We got put on the radio once. Um, and just trying to make it. And it's tough because just how the whole music scene, like you fall into that party lifestyle and you can only go so far right. while living yeah. at home before, before your parents are like, well, what's the deal, man? What are, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And they were very supportive. And at some point when the band started to fall apart, it was like, okay, well, I'm 21 years old. Mm-hmm. It's, it's time to, you know, I gave this my best shot, you know? And really yeah. the only way that I feel people make it musically is if you don't have a backup plan. And you put everything yeah. in. Just yeah. go for it. Yeah. yeah, but at some point it was like. But that's a risk too, because if you don't have somebody like your parents going, okay, dude, like, let's go. Yeah. Then you're. You yeah. Know. And at the time I'm starving, like, <laughs> you know, and there's no money. At the time that we played, we made enough money to pay for our parking. You know, like, wasn't, <laughs> right. there wasn't any money in the original music scene in Philly. You know, there were people that were playing cover bands, you know, or cover music and, and they were making a ton of money. Like, they wasn't, you know. 
Mm. Like I like every time we would play, I had a I had a black hooded sweatshirt that I wore that, that said cover band suck. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because like, they just go in and yeah, that's, yeah, that's but, where the money is. So that's yeah, yeah that's, that's where the money is at, at the bar scenes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we just never wanted to. We want never. We wanted, we wanted to do our own thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it was like. All right, it's time to. So I sold out big time, became a cop. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you you wanted to do different genres and everything. Was there as kind of time went on? Was there something like, hey, yeah, I, I think I drum like this person, or this is the best rock drummer. I want to mm -hmm. be like to, like anything. So there's a guy named uh, Mike Portnoy. Mm -hmm. He's the drummer for Dream Theater. Mm -hmm. um, he was who he was the one that I studied the most. Probably, I really uh, mimicked my style after his. You know, but and it's and it's. You know, in canine, when I was in canine, I know I'm jumping ahead, but when I was in canine, we have, we contract with businesses and churches mm -hmm. for their buildings, for building an area search. So anytime there's a church with a, with a drum set, mm -hmm. I'm hitting it for sure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like, you know, we got to get yeah. a drum set in here. Yeah, yeah. we do. <laughs> a drum set? That's what yeah. Yeah. Think of. Yeah. Up on the third floor. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, hell yeah. We'll put it. We got extra space now. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah you do. Ashley, did you have something? Oh, I was going to ask if, if you always in the back of your mind had an interest in law enforcement or not really? No, it's a good question. And, and, and I did, there's a little bit of a backstory to that as well. Um, so my grandfather, um, he went into the Navy at 17 and then right from the Navy, he went to the Marine Corps. Um, and then when he got out, um, he was in law enforcement. Um, I think he was an investigator for the, um, prosecutor's office in, in Jersey. And he did a lot of prisoner transport and stuff. And, um, and he also raised German shepherds. Um, when my dad mm -hmm. was growing up. And so it's, and it's, you know, as I was growing up, I didn't know my grandfather very well. Um, he passed away when I was in sixth or seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always, I wish that he knew where me and Jeff Clement, who's my cousin, where we ended up, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. being in canine, working yeah. with dogs, he would have been so proud, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that was a, there was a little bit of a drive there that was kind of mm -hmm. in my blood that there's, there's law enforcement there. But um, what really kind of sold me that, I could see myself doing that is, um, it's so funny because I talk about the program dare mm -hmm. in schools. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then ended up being like the rock and roll scene. Like I put, <laughs> I put, I put that to bed. Right? I know, I know uh, drugs are bad, but <laughs> bam, they're good. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, why do kids use drugs? Uh, cause they're awesome. Right? <laughs> They don't tell you that part. <laughs> yeah. You find that out joke, on the kids. street. Yeah. Don't do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or wait, so, don't get caught. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's always that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if it grows in the ground, it's probably safe. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Boom. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. So uh, the dare officer, um, it's so funny how like, you know, people in your life in a young age can make an impact on you. Um, his name was Richard Norcross um, and he was my dare officer. And so in Haddon Heights, like I mentioned, there's like seven officers in Haddon Heights. So I think when I was in fourth or fifth grade, I think it was the same year that I was, that I had dare, um, uh, Rich Norcross and a U.S. Marshal went to serve a warrant on a guy that lived in Haddon Heights, um, not too far from my house. Um, I think his name was, uh, Leslie Nielsen and he, um, yeah, like the actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Surely and, you can't be serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Shirley. <laughs> 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 I knew someone was going to pick up on that for sure. Uh, <laughs> the hospital, so, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So they, they, uh, they make contact with the house. The mom answers the door. They're like, hey, we have a, a warrant for your son. And they're like, okay, he's upstairs. And so they have zero training. Like down, in, like down here, you know, I think it'd be handled different, but they have zero training. So they just walk in the house, start walking upstairs, and fatal funnel upstairs, and the suspect comes out to the landing with an AK and just opened mm -hmm. up on... Um, the marshal and, and Rich. The marshal was killed. Rich was shot up um, multiple times, um, blew off his, his thumb to his right hand. Uh, he was able to crawl out of the house, screaming for help. And they're like, okay, well, four other officers are coming. You know, it's like, and so Rich's brother, John, was one of the first ones to show up. And as soon as he got out of the car, he was hit in the head with the AK. Mm -hmm. And it turned into a big uh, SWAT call. And like my school got released. They didn't do really lockdowns then. We got released. I got sent home early. You know, just get <laughs> There's a home. shooter out there. Go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah everyone run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I remember I was outside. My dad was like, hey, so I think your dare officer got shot today, you know. And uh, I think I like the idea of law enforcement at a young age of 
uh, having the opportunity to fight people who can't fight for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So Rich is, he's out of the fight. There's no way he can fight. Well, then County County SWAT comes, you know, and they end up, um, and I ended up being barricaded subject. He eventually gives up and he, he either got the death penalty or he got life in prison. One of the two in Jersey. Um, I forget if Jersey has um, the death penalty. It got crazy after I left, so they might change that. I'm not sure. Mm. But even at a young age, that didn't like spark my interest. Like I'm going to be a cop. But I think it it got the wheels turning. There was a pilot flame there for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, and you mentioned so then what? So you because you kind of jumped ahead a little bit earlier, but so you were up there, mm -hmm. not going to be a rock star. Yeah, that dream, that dream died. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So why then, here? Yeah, yeah. So at the time, uh, my cousin Jeff Clement, he he works in the K nine unit now. At the time, um, he was an SRO, and here, at here for okay. Pinellas. Yeah, he he went to school in Kentucky, and then he moved to Pinellas, and he was um, one of the uh, drill instructors for the boot camp when we used to have the boot camp. Um, worked in the jail first, and then transferred to the boot camp, and he's phenomenal with kids, and so that seemed like a really good calling for him. But it, um, at some point, he transferred to the road. But at the time the, um, the sheriff's office in order to get promoted, they had the matrix system. Mm -hmm. So you got certain points based on which units you have gone to. So mm -hmm. he kind of bounced around a little bit in anticipation of getting promoted. And then that, that matrix system kind of went away. Um, after I moved down here, they started making some changes to the promotional process. And so I called Jeff. Um, my dad was very involved in that whole decision because, you know, I told dad, like, hey, I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm done with this. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm down. I'm definitely going to miss it. It's in my blood playing, playing music, but it's not paying the bills and I can't live here, you know, much longer. It's kind of starting to get embarrassing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and my dad knew that I had an interest in law enforcement, specific, uh, specifically working uh, with dogs. I always thought the canines are just incredible, you know, um, their abilities and what they can be trained to do. And we always had dogs growing up. And so I always had a, a passion for, for dogs. And so my dad was like, you know, Jeff loves where he works. And when I lived in Jersey, you vacationed in Florida, mm -hmm. okay. you know? So I was like, all right, so I'm going to call Jeff. And I didn't talk, Jeff used to babysit me, you know, that's how, <laughs> you know, but I didn't talk to him in, in so long. And so my dad sent me his number and I called him. I'm like, it's kind of out of the blue, man. But I'm, I'm thinking about coming down here, maybe going to school, maybe doing what you do. And so he kind of set things up for me. Um, he and, didn't try to discourage you? No, <laughs> no. He said he loved it down there, down here. And, uh, you know, he's just, uh, you know, asked me some of the roundabout questions about like, all right, can you, can you pass this stuff? Like, what have you done? I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm a decent kid, man. I'm, I think I would do well here. So, um, me and my dad flew down here and I did a ride along and how'd there, that go? Who, who'd you ride with? I rode with, uh, he doesn't work here anymore. I think he got fired. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to name him then. Never <laughs> no, mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what'd you, what'd you see on your first ride along? So, um, <laughs> It's very different from uh, Jersey police. You know, so Jersey state police is very different than FHP. Mm -hmm. Jersey state police are uh, the best of the best. Mm -hmm. At the time, you couldn't get hired at, to be a Jersey state trooper unless you were six feet. Mm -hmm. They had to change that at some point, but... Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but, uh, oh, God. but they were um, they were legit. Like, you got pulled over by a state trooper, like, surely I'm going to die today. You know, they, it was, <laughs> that was, those guys were terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sheriffs... Do they even exist in New Jersey? So they so they do the sheriff's office, but the, all they do is the court system. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. In, in yeah. the previous thing, when you said SWAT came out, where did the SWAT come from during, during that? that uh, Camden County thought, SWAT. Oh. So the oh. counties had their own SWAT teams. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Camden County uh, had their own SWAT team and all the different counties. And so Cherry Hill, Haddon Heights, all these little areas, Haddon Field, Audubon, that was all part of Camden County. Okay. Um, and the city of Camden. Um, so, but it, was a, but it was a county function. So it wasn't even yes. under like the sheriff. It was nope. just, yeah. yeah. So, but, so they uh, would pull like from the different cities to exactly. create. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. So, but you know, again, people come here like, oh, well, sheriff's office and they might come from New York or Pennsylvania or New Jersey exactly. where sheriffs are not. Yeah really there. Exactly. But then they yeah. also say, oh, well, the state police. It's like, well, you know, FHP right. kind of only does traffic related stuff. And I didn't and, know that either, right? right? Because you think about like in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania state troopers, Jersey state troopers, those guys are legit. You know, they still are, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, and it's a, it's a hard program to get through. Mm -hmm. The how it's structured is so different from up north, mm -hmm. you, know? Mm -hmm. you know? Right. So now Jeff obviously was working here. Did you always say, I'm just going to go work where Jeff does or were you kind of open yeah. or what so, was the reputation uh, of the sheriff's office like at the time? Uh, so it was, yeah, I, Jeff would always tell me like, you don't mess with the star, man. Everyone's afraid of the star, man. You know, uh, he would say, you know, people, most people that go to the academy, if they get hired by other agencies. It's just to get 
some experience and they transferred to the sheriff's office, you know. Because mm. um, the sheriff's office wasn't sponsoring them in the they academy. They were not sponsoring, and, no. And they really and the weren't only, hiring anyone. No, the experience. only way you got hired was if you knew someone. Yeah. And and that person had to have a really good reputation to vouch for that person yeah. trying to get hired. Mm-hmm. You um, knew someone. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. I did. Even though it yeah. was just Jeff. It was just Jeff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then in the academy, it's funny because I listened to, to Jana on the podcast. Yeah. B, BJ Lyons was a big advocate for me to get hired as well because mm-hmm. he taught me in the academy. Um, a couple of things in the academy. And so um, so I was one of the few guys, I think maybe it was one or two guys in my academy class that wore a suit for graduation. Everyone else is in uniform. And it's like, yeah. man, and Jeff said, like, I got you, man. Just trust me, I got you. It's like, all right, man, I moved down here. I don't have any job, you know. Mm-hmm. I lived with Jeff's dad um, while I moved down here, while I was going to the academy. Um, he passed away, um, I think in 2007. Mm-hmm. But... Um, so I, you know, I, I graduated from the academy in 05 and, um, during that time I was kind of making some connections with, um, people that worked at the sheriff's office, you know, mm-hmm. some of my instructors, um, Mike Keeling was one of my instructors. And then, uh, yeah, you, you were in the, in the like Vickers Tapia, who else was there? Was, yeah. Taz, was Taz there when you were there? I did not have Taz. No, I had Jim Vickers, um, Rick Tapia, Randy Corlett, mm-hmm. Mike Killian, and, um, Gosh, I can't remember his name right now. He's still, I think he runs the academy right now. He's the head of the academy, but he was in there. Um, but, and it's funny because uh, Mike Killian, Randy Corlett, and Jim Vickers, I all worked for as sergeants at some point, mm-hmm. you know, and they're all mm-hmm. my instructors, you mm-hmm. know. Um, Mike Killian, definitely the the longest. But um, but I, I think from the academy, like my relationship with Randy Corlett and Mike Killian um, is really from the academy. You know, it was the first, yeah. first, first guys that I really clung to and, mm-hmm. and got some information from and really, um, almost an, like an example, you know, mm-hmm. um, is so, that still the situation now at the academy that some of our, um, trainers work in the academy? A, there's a few, I'm not sure how many. Okay. Like it's a separate it. gig, right? It is. <laughs> it yeah. is. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're hired by Sepsi, by yeah, by the college they're hired to, to do. But that's the same. It it was like that then too. Yes. Into the, okay. Yeah. yeah gotcha. So the college. So the academy is college accredited. So if you right. if you go mm-hmm. in with thirty credits and you graduate the academy, you come out with your associates. You know. Right. So okay. I'm, I'm definitely getting ahead of myself on this, but since you know I want to talk about the academy and how you did, and yeah. because you have no law enforcement background, nothing, and yeah. the interest is there. But yeah. now you know you fast forward to now. You're in training. You're I consider you to be a, a pretty uh, squared away deputy as far as training tactics. You're out there training our next generation of of deputies. Like, yep. Where did that that come from what what did was it in was it and the reason i'm asking is was it because of your initial you know exposure to some of these folks in, in training the mike killings they were like hey th- these guys are squared away it's really important or was there a situation where it clicked or, or what's the deal there yeah you know i don't and i don't really know where to credit it from i think a lot of it happened in the academy there's a lot of uh, uh competition in the academy mm-hmm. And I learned pretty early on, like, you don't want to be first in the academy. You definitely don't want to be last. Just hang out in the middle, mm-hmm. you know, kind of do <laughs> yeah. your thing. But, uh, like, one of the guys I went to the academy with, um, Mike Spitaleri, he's a lieutenant for Clearwater, Clearwater now. Yeah. Um, we're oh, like yeah. brothers. Yeah, we're really close. But he, um, we became really close in the, in the academy. And, uh, you know, we were always trying to, like, who's going to get the most push-ups? You know, Mike, Mike beat me for sure. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I definitely, that's where I, in the academy, I think that's where I, I started I think it was there's an understanding of um, I don't know how to fight, mm-hmm. and um, but I knew that physical fitness is going to be paramount for this. You got to right? be good at it. To yeah, succeed, you're, si- you're signing up to solve problems and probably fight people, and you have to be in better shape than they are. Mm-hmm. And so you know, there's definitely like like a farce fire that that started in the academy of like you know I'm I'm going to take this seriously, and um, so we're out of the academy, and the academy was. Uh, I enjoyed the whole, uh, the pressure on DT because, you know, like, you know, getting in trouble, having to do X amount of pushups, like, let's go, you know, mm-hmm. like it's a free workout. Every but day. now were you, were you into fitness and stuff before this yeah. at all? Or I always worked out, me and my dad worked out, um, really my entire adolescence and through high school, we worked out together all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was there any point at all in the academy or within maybe your first, your early the infancy of your law enforcement career, we were like... Maybe this ain't it. Never. Never happened. I think a lot of it is I moved away from home. Mm-hmm. I went all in. It was all know? new. There was no there was no giving up. Like this is what you signed up for. Mm-hmm. If it sucks, suck it up and finish it. You Did know you burn your bridges back in New Jersey? I didn't burn my napalm those things, man. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Gone. Yeah. yeah. 
just, yeah. just for that clean break so you can that's focus. It. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, that's one thing that I've learned about myself is that when I commit to something, man, I'm, I'm a donkey. I can't, I can't be stopped, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that's a, that's a double-edged sword, right? Right. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, coming out of the academy, um, especially talking to like Rick Tapia, um, those guys who are so passionate about training mm -hmm. and this is how you survive is, is training and physical fitness, like everything else that you can learn, but mm -hmm. you have to have the, the, the mindset, you know, and, and you can have all the mindset in the world, but if you haven't trained your body to, you know, react accordingly, you know, right. or, you know, it's just not going to work not out. Work, so you know. right out of the Academy, um, before I even got hired, uh, like as soon as I graduated the Academy, um, I went and joined a jujitsu gym under Eduardo de Lima's Gracie Baja gym in Clearwater. Wait, when did you train? When were you there? I started in 06. So we must have met each other then. Is that when yeah, you were going? Yeah. Eduardo? Yeah. 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 I was with Eduardo and then followed yeah. the lineage up until recently. So. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah. So oh, I, was, I don't remember you. I, yeah. I started Never look at some old pictures. <laughs> I was in 06. So his, his, what was it? His, was it a 10 or 11 o'clock class in the mornings? That's when I would always go. Um, Cause I was waiting to get hired. So I was going through the process. And so uh -huh. I valid, I was uh, mowing lawns while I was going to the academy. And then I was valeting cars at Island Way and Salt Rock Grill, mm. which was kind of awesome. Like mm -hmm. driving yeah. Lamborghinis and Bentleys yeah. and cars, oh, like yeah. everything. Like mm -hmm. you're never gonna be able to drive this being a cop. So like, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Unless we start so, doing uh, what are you a Jersey call? state trooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to those guys paychecks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, it was like Valley and cars. God, there's yeah. gotta be some stories there. There's something there with yeah. Valley and cars. There's something about that. Yeah, well, it was a pretty good gig because they, um, you had to pay, I forget how much you had to give back to the company, mm -hmm. but everything else was tips. And so yeah. really the more cars you violated, the more money. Mm -hmm. And I just hustled. I come out of the academy, I could run forever, right? So I was like, <laughs> I was making some money valuing cars, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so um, I think when I went to jujitsu and I met Jeff Katita uh, before I even got hired, mm -hmm. at the time he was a purple belt and, uh, just really impressed with him. And he, he had a lot of, he was really good friends with um, my cousin as well. Cause they were in the boot camp together. So Jeff had a lot, Jeff Katita had a lot of, um, I owe a lot of, of his kind of guidance, but inspiration of being like, man, this kid can fight, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and so then I just, I just decided that I'm all in on, on this as well. The sheriff's um, office, you mean? The sheriff's oh. office and, uh, and learn to fight and learn uh, to okay. jiu-jitsu. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you weren't sponsors. You're in the academy. You graduate the academy. Yep. And then how long from when you graduated do you, how does that go down when you get the call or apply or whatever it is? Yeah. So I graduated in 05. And during that time I was coming into the, it was the old SAB then, um, and meeting with some of the um, admin through Jeff, um, just kind of putting a face with the name. And as soon as I got out of the academy, I started going through the application process and doing the whole background checks, the psych, like eval, um, polygraph, all that stuff. Because I was smoking cigarettes ever since I was, I don't know, 16 or so. Mm -hmm. And then Jeff was like, well, hey, you got to quit smoking cigarettes. I'm like, okay, done. You know. And so when I moved down here, legit, like, quit smoking or whatever. It was fine. Cold turkey? Cold, cold turkey, yeah. Yes. It was e again, it was easy because I was so motivated. I'm getting hired by this place. You right. Know? Um, yeah, when I did my ride along, the deputy, like, taste someone. I was like, Dude, we don't have tasers in Jersey, man. This place is gangster. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like a deputy got in a fight. I'm sitting in the car, like I have to move here. You know, like, <laughs> you know, this is awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. So then I went through the process and I got hired in March. My swearing date was March 20th of 06. Okay. Yeah, and uh, who did I get hired with? I got hired with Mike Gattarello. Okay. Mike had mm -hmm. some done some time in St. Pete, um, and uh, he was in my hiring class. So how was FTO? Was it, so was it still structured like it is now? There's some yes. in-house with training, yeah. which yep. I always tout, like not every agency does that. Like yeah. th there's a, there's some sort of in-house, but it's not nearly as extensive as what we do here. My in-house was, was awesome. Cause I had John Miller, Randy Corlett, Mike Killian. I mean, just studs, you know? And so I, I learned a lot in my in-house In my first phase FTO, um, he was terminated also, <laughs> <laughs> but I learned, maybe it's you. It, may, it could be, yeah. yeah. Like a black widow. Right? Yeah. But I, I learned everything, how to be a cop from uh, first phase FTO. I mean, he was a former Marine and his presence and his ability to control a scene immediately. And I recognized that when he walked up to a scene, it didn't matter what deputy was there, who's taking the cover, the complainant or the victim or the suspect would immediately turn and start talking to my FTO. Mm -hmm. He immediately controlled and I was like, that's, that's the staple right there. Mm -hmm. That's how you have to be. Um, I learned a lot in my FTO time. 
Um, and I got released from FTO into North Mids, um, which was easy, but because I did FTO there, I knew the area mm -hmm. and I knew where to go to hunt. Um, but I didn't really, I didn't really start, start thriving in patrol until I came down and I was assigned to 33, the Baskins car. Mm -hmm. And me and Mike Gattarello were a two man car and Mike Gattarello, uh, spent most of his time here in narcotics, but Mike was, uh, that's, I learned how to work street level dope from Mike. Um, just really good at identifying people. And there's a, um, there's a file at Nasus that he created that majority of the players and Baskins were built into, and he knew them all by name. They could shave their heads from when they had dredge and all shaved heads. He knew exactly who they were. He was incredible at it. And so I learned everything from Gat as far as working street level dope. And then he, uh, he transferred to narcotics during that time. And about six months to a year after that, I transferred to uh, K9. And backing up a little bit, I, I tried out for in K9 uh, in 2008. And at the time, you had to be a deputy for five years before you could try out for K9. Really? Mm -hmm. Three years for SWAT, and I made it on the SWAT team in three, um, after year three. And then I made it in K9 after year five. But I tried out in 08. At the time, the Sergeant Clark Wagner, um, he had seen my name in the guy's training logs because I would just attach myself to uh, Jim Vickers, Tony LaRusso, Nick like Baez. Like even in FTO, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember during uh, FTO, um, my FTO got a hold of uh, Jim Vickers, who I knew from the academy. And said, "Hey, this kid I have wants to do canine, and you know I was catching uh, Jim's dog torn FTO, and it was just like I was hooked. I was absolutely yeah. hooked. Like I have to do this." And Vickers was the sergeant of no at the time. He was just a deputy. Just, just yeah, deputy? he was just deputy okay. then. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but yeah, so I it was one of those things where like a light bulb went off. Mm -hmm. Like this is the only reason I'm going to be a cop is because a canine. You know, I was just like so really during the time when I was working midnights. And once I got FTO, if a call came out was canine related, I was running with the canine. I just wanted to just saturate myself in everything about canine, just learn as much as I could. Mm. And so because Clark Wagner had seen my name on some of the guy's training logs, um, I put in a memo to, to try out. And he was like, I can guarantee you're not getting a spot. You don't have your time on, but if you want to come <laughs> check it out. And I did pretty well. And so I now, you know, they knew what I was about. And so I kind of got on their list, if you would. Mm -hmm. What's the tryout? Uh, similar to what you guys do now? No. no. Uh, the tryout now is, it's so funny because like I listen to the podcast and they talk about like, well, CRT's got the hardest, SWAT's got the hardest. Like it's a joke compared to K9. <laughs> it's a princess, <laughs> it's a princess program, seriously. Like, <laughs> oh. Yeah, it really uh, is. It's going to be three-way competition <laughs> here. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah I, mean, I haven't seen CRT tryouts, but I've seen both SWAT and yeah. K9 and K9's, yeah, I, yeah. K9's another level. Yeah, and so uh, when we changed, the, the tryout at the time for K9, um, it was difficult, but it, we, didn't have the, we, we didn't really have the property um, mm -hmm. then to really kind of make it how we want to. And um, when we changed the tryout, um, myself, Tony LaRusso, uh, Jake Viano, a couple other guys, um, and over time we developed it and added things and we made a monster of a tryout. And one that is not to haze or, um, you know, to prevent people from getting in the unit, but it's things that we have taken from live tracks, um, things that you're probably gonna see, things that you're gonna have to be able to do. And um, while being tired and while being able to think clearly, you know, and people don't understand, and I think even, you know, you know, the guys that, that, that run the sheriff's office, I think that they, you know, th there's a lack of understanding on what we do. They know what yeah. canine does. You have, don't have a clue what we really do and what mm -hmm. it takes to do this job, you know? And what, what I love about uh, Pinellas and what I learned quickly um, early on, and definitely when I was in the canine unit, is Pinellas County is the tip of the spear in tracking. We always have been. We'll go to competitions and, you know, we'll get beaten in competitions by some of the top teams like Lakeland or or some of these other teams, and they'll tell you, like, you can't beat us in competition, but we can never track like you, you know? And so, you know. Like, like real world tracking. Real world yeah. tracking, yeah. And everyone tracks a little bit differently. Like Pasco County, they've really put themselves on the, on the map lately on, on tracking. Mm -hmm. um, but we've always been great at tracking. And, you know, I think the agency as a whole from, you know, from deputies all the way up to, you know, management, I don't think like I understand how spoiled they are with this K9 unit. They're insane, just how good they are, you know. Because you, you just travel a lot and go to different seminars, you know, you see that there are some agencies that still have a hard time tracking on pavement, have a hard time, you know, they won't area search, and our guys are surgical on pavement, you know. It's just, yeah. we always have been. And so, it was, there's a lot that? of pride how, in that. How do you do that? So, um, so when you're tracking, the, you know, what the, what the dog is actually smelling is what they call skin rafts, and, and it's dead skin cells that fall off the body. And there's no way to control it. It doesn't matter if you take on, take off clothes, put on clothes. 
they're going to saturate their waist through the clothing and they're going to fall off and they, they, they will leave a trail that the dog can smell. So our dogs are actually trailing dogs is what you call them. They're not true tracking dogs. A tracking dog is like sport where they're going to go step for step, footstep for footstep. Our dogs don't track like that. They're going to trail using the wind to their advantage. Um, and so when they, when someone's running through a grassy area or where there's vegetation, those skin rafts will get caught up in the vegetation. Think of it as like confetti, right? So mm-hmm. it's going to fall and get, and then get stuck in there. Well, because there's, there's, these are microscopic, there's no technology in the world that exists that can find human scent like a canine can. And every person smells differently, similar to fingerprints. No two people smell the same. Yeah. And so uh, when those skin rafts fall onto the pavement, there's nothing to stop that for the wind taking it. Right? Mm-hmm. If a car drives over that, it's, 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 it's gone. gone. Mm-hmm. You know? and so now you have to figure out where that goes. But if you have, now granted, if, if someone ticks off running at you know, 3 p.m. at Home Depot and it's July, yeah. there's people everywhere like, yeah, you're probably not going to get a track. Right. But- three in the morning and the guy ran through the Home Depot parking lot, our dog's going to find that guy, you know. I don't want to glaze over SWAT. So you were, you were part of SWAT first? Yeah, I only did a, uh, a little over two years on SWAT. Um, I enjoyed my time on SWAT. I was on the competition team uh, for the roundup, um, the SWAT roundup. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. And I had some really good guys on the team. Um, Bobby Cahoon was my team leader. I was on Charlie's team. I had Bobby Cahoon. Um, Dave Danzig wasn't, I'm sorry, Greg Danzig wasn't uh, a leader on the team yet, but he was on my team. And so I really looked up to Greg. Um, Captain Jackson was on Charlie. Um, I felt like anytime we had an operation, me and Melvin were always paired together. Um, so I really enjoyed my time on Charlie's team, uh, especially under Bobby. And then I tried out for K9 during my time on SWAT where I knew I wasn't going to get it. And then I was able to try out again in 2010 while I was on SWAT. And, and that's when I got it. Um, and I had John Miller and SWAT was really difficult then, really difficult. Um, the tryout was difficult, um, but staying on the team was really hard. Um, the training days were really hard. There was eight hour training day and there was a three hour range day. The three hour range days were so much harder than the eight hour. So I would come to work in my SWAT uniform. I'd start at three, I worked three to 11 in Baskins. Um, and then SWAT training didn't start until seven. So my sergeant let me wear my SWAT uniform and then I would just go to SWAT from seven to 10. And just about every day after SWAT, I'm in pretty good shape, especially on SWAT. You know, I would, on my way back to Baskins for my last hour, I would pull over every time and throw up. It was insane how hard those three hour range days. They eventually went to eight hour range days, and those were like a walk in the park. There was so much, because <laughs> there was so much more time. Yeah. They crammed so much PT and shooting and running and moving. And it's just like, it was a really difficult time to be on SWAT. But because there wasn't a ton of work on SWAT at the time, I was like, you know, uh, if I got the opportunity to go to K9, and as it as it turned out, I got K9 in 2011, and I stayed on the team for a little bit during K9 school, and I just I eventually came to understand like I'm not willing to swear, I don't want to share this experience with SWAT. I'm I'm going to get off, yeah. you know. So I had a good time, and I made a, got a lot of good relationships, and I got uh, all my training as far as uh, tactically and 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 room clearing, which benefits me now, and and well benefit my entire career for sure. Mm-hmm. But uh, being able to teach that now um, in the training unit. Um, so SWAT has really followed me my entire career. Mm-hmm. But for me, there really wasn't enough game time to justify staying on the team. When canine is canine is SWAT every day. Yeah. You know? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True story. Yeah. Um, all right. So canine, first dog. How'd it go? Ooh, canine school is tough. Um, Jim Vickers ran my canine school. Um, and uh, we never PT'd in canine because Jim though I would call him out. I know I could out PT him all day. Um, and so we never did any PT, but it was just you can't do anything right for 16 weeks. Yeah. You're just, you just suck at everything, right? Um, and I hated my first dog. Absolutely hated him during Kenai school. Uh-huh. Just because I just didn't know what I had, you know? And really, I think as a deputy, when you look at the canine handlers, you're like, oh yeah, working on a dog is easy. You, you put a lead on them and you go find people. And it's that simple. And there's a relationship that needs to be built with that dog. There's gotta be oh, yeah. mutual trust with that dog. There's, the, there's a lot that goes into it. And building that bond is very difficult. And my dog, uh, I named him Bosco. Um, Bosco, he was an all black German shepherd. He he came from Poland. Um, Bosco wanted nothing to do with anyone. It wasn't just me. He wanted to do anything with anyone. Yeah. I mean, if he got a toy, he'd run to the furthest corner of the yard and lay down in the training field. And, you know, the other instructors in Kenai school would be like, get him to come back to you. And I'd be dancing around, call him, laying on the ground. He'd look at me like, you're an idiot. (laughs) Just had wanted nothing to do with me. And then just, uh, but he would do everything. He was a great tracking dog. He would do everything as far as bite work and building search and evidence recovery. He would do everything. He just wanted nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. And there was talk of getting rid of him, getting rid of him. Really? Yeah, just because he refused to build a bond with anyone. It's like, you can't work a dog that doesn't, you know, can't listen to him. And, and, there, and there's a point in canine school when you're like, is it the dog or is it the handler, right? Like, 
is should the handler just be better or does or is this dog a dud? You know, and it's hard to answer that question sometimes. And so once what I started doing when I got home from canine school, because just the stress of being yelled at for doing everything wrong, like it's really I found it very difficult to uh, perform and do well. And I've been through SWAT school and like getting screamed at isn't isn't whatever, it's a thing. But like really wanted to do well in canine and I'm constantly being told that I suck at it. Like, man, I should have stayed in Baskins and stayed on SWAT. This is like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I had a pretty good gig. Mm. Well, everyone was being told they sucked though, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's still the same way. I think it's, I think it's a little bit more. When I run, when I ran canine schools, I had the understanding of, listen, this school's going to be tough, but if you're not having fun, the dogs definitely aren't going to have fun. And I was yeah. whole falling apart. So even though when I run canine schools, I'm very hard on them physically. There, there's a lot of physical punishment but no one's going to scream at you or, or belittle you because the dog's got to have fun. If you come out there stressed all the time, the dogs aren't having fun. The only reason the dogs want to be police dog is because it's fun. They don't know how dangerous the job is. It's our right. job to protect them. Yeah. Right. And so I, um, so after canine school at the time, my wife was working and she didn't get up until seven or eight o'clock. I would get home from canine school at five and I would spend time in my backyard just doing food obedience with, with Bosco. And so I ended up, uh, training a lot of Bosco. Now, granted, everyone showed me what it should look like. So I knew it was wrong. I knew it was right. Mm -hmm. And within a few weeks, um, his obedience got really good and our bond just solidified. And then like we were, we were, we were best friends then. Yeah. And when I got out of canine school, we were unstoppable for, for eight years. We caught, mm -hmm. I think 213 people in eight years. Wow. Uh, he was an incredible dog. I was very fortunate to have him because I learned everything about being a dog handler. And that allowed me to teach other handlers mm -hmm. based on what I learned from Bosco. Because he wasn't easy. He was not easy. Right. I really had to work at it. There's, and I've been told there are guys who are just, they're just very good at canine just naturally. Jake Viano, I was told, was one of those guys. Just came from narcotics, jumped into canine, and was phenomenal at it. You know, just, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. I really had to work hard at, at canine to be good at it. But there's so much pride and so much... Uh, you can see almost, you can see the out the the output uh, the output of your work right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, Bosco was not great on track on tracking on pavement and I just worked like crazy on pavement when I got out of canine school just nonstop I was just uh, I was obsessed with getting him track on pavement mm -hmm. and our very first catch was through th three parking lots all pavement my very first catch so it was <laughs> like oh man I'm making this work this, dog, yeah. this dog's actually good well, that's you know? a good point though I never thought of really because you know everybody trains right if you're a deputy in patrol you're training training all the time even kind of your example from SWAT like no game time yeah but canine yeah. is game time every day every day because you've been working with this dog on training and I know even if you guys are if you don't have calls nothing going on you're out there laying training tracks all the time yeah. so you're trying to make that progress but yeah. it's always been fascinating to me because well canine was kind of one of the first places that I got hazed uh, as a civilian by Mike yeah uh, <laughs> But you go out there and it's like, I can't imagine, like my dog at home, you know, he's a German Shepherd, but he's a moron. Yeah. yeah. And I still, we still look at each other. I'm like, what is wrong with you? You know? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. but you know, I still, if I call him over to come, he'll, he listens, he sits, he does all those things. But that, that's just to live. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is, not, yeah, this yeah. is not my job, you know? Yeah. So just to take a brand new person and a puppy that just came out of who knows where. It's hard. And now it's like, okay. It's really there hard, it and I don't think uh, I don't think people understand. You get this dog that come from a not only to come from another country. He was on a like a kennel at another country, and then he gets to a kennel in mm -hmm. the states, and then he's being like tested by multiple different agencies. Then he's finally picked, and then he goes to the kennels at the sheriff's office, yeah. and then he goes lives with with a family, and he's trying to figure out where do he's I had insert. No stability yeah. his yeah. whole life. He's just right. confused. Yeah. They're yeah. pack animals. They have to yeah. find out where they fit yeah. the pack. You know, that just takes a while. You know, but um, there's so much pride in canine and there's a lot of competition. When I first got in, it was Bob Livernois, Bobby Cahoon, um, Kevin Andres, Jim Vickers, Nick Baez, Tony Russo. These are monsters of canine. Mm -hmm. And it was like, man, that's, that is, that's the level, right? That's a that level mm -hmm. to be at. And I like to think that I completely surpassed all that, you know. I remember during, during canine school, you know, one of the times like, because it was hard. At some point, Jimmy and I started getting it's a long school. It's 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. point later, there's no way I'm getting out of here without killing this guy. You know, at some point I told him like, I'm going to be better than you for sure at this. <laughs> and it's so funny. Once, yeah. I, got, once I got out of canine school and that's the thing, my second dog, I realized like, he wasn't even that good. <laughs> <laughs> I killed him in competitions. I killed him in catches. Like, uh. he wasn't even that good. <laughs> <laughs> so any, uh, any memorable? Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not sorry, Jimmy. No, not at all. Uh, any, uh, any memorable catches, anything with Bosco? Is that, is, you almost drowned with him, yeah? I did, yeah. <laughs> We had a lot of close calls, man. Yeah. <laughs> but one that was like very early on. So I got out of Canyon school in May. 
And in August of 011, um, oh, 11, Jesus. In <laughs> August, 2011, I got, um, we got, again, we were a little bit more uh, lenient on pursuits. Stolen car, turned to pursuit. Um, their deputy pitted the car. They crashed at the intersection of uh, McMullen Booth and Union Street, where Union goes one way towards the school and Cedar goes in towards um, Lincoln Highlands. Yeah. So I, uh, I get there and I say, hey, the, the passenger bailed. Uh, we don't know where he went, but the driver ran and jumped this fence into the woods. All right. And so this fence had no crossbar, right? And so they're really hard to jump because there's no stability in the fence. Yeah. And the top of the uh, fence isn't curled over. So it's all pointed like you're, and there's no easy way to do it. We included that kind of fence in the trial because there's no, almost we're looking for ideas on how to do this better, <laughs> right? But you just jump over it and you're going to get cut up. It is what it is. Just throw yourself over. So I got Bosco over, I get over the fence and I start going and the woods turns into a swamp. I ended up being knee deep to waist deep. Eventually at some point I was chest deep. At the time we didn't have the tack vest. Every, all my equipment is on my belt. Yeah. Oh. And so my radio, my gun, everything's yeah. completely submerged. And it's not the watery mud. It's the mud that like every, t every step you're in, like there's no one getting my leg out it's, of there. It's like quicksand. It's yeah, like it's, what we all worried about as kids. Yeah. We thought there's going to be a lot crazy. of quicksand in our futures and there TV actually and, is. Yeah. 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 That's a thing. Like you're supposed to grab right? an anaconda like, from the tree and pull yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Well, it's um, like, so funnily enough, that? right. I was grabbing vegetation trying to pull me mm -hmm. and it's coming right out of the ground. Uh, and I think with all my stuff on at the time, you know, I think I was like maybe like two thirty or something like that with all my stuff on. So I'm just thinking, can't get through. And Bosco was on the top of the mud barking yeah. and pulling, trying to go, like, let me go. And I remember in canine school, you know, Vickers had an incident where he got stuck in the mud and, and the suspect ended up drowning during a fight. But, you know, Jimmy said, if you ever get stuck in the mud, lean back on your dog and carriage in the track and just gain some ground back. Yeah. So lean back on Bosco. And Bosco's a smaller German Shepherd. It was all black. You, you say like, lean back on him. What yeah, do you mean? What is that? Like so, physically lean back on him? Yeah, so with the lead, we, so at the time with Bosco, I tracked with a nine-foot leash. And so you just lean back on, on the line. So you're pulling, you're putting tension against him. Oh, so hoping the dog's going to yeah. pull against that tension, yeah. you know? Okay. okay. And so eventually, like, I'm like, this is not working. Like, I'm like, come on, seek track. And he's barking and pulling. And I'm like, this is not working. And realized, not realizing that I had been, I came from my chest back to my waist. I'm like, oh, shit. So then I laid on the mud disperse my weight and continue to bend. I eventually got pulled out and I would low crawl the rest of the track through the oh. mud. And then when I got out, I was at a fence and Bosco was trying to jump the fence. I'm like, hey man, time, time out. <laughs> yeah. you, know, like, you legit I, could have yeah. died there. Yeah, I was yeah. You I was probably, You close. couldn't reach your radio or anything, right? No, Nothing? at the time, wow. like 1024 is the, I'm probably going to die if I don't mm -hmm. get someone here. And I was very close to calling 1024. Um, oh. But it wouldn't have mattered. My radio completely went out. Um, I can't get to my gun. My gun was completely kicked in mud. I couldn't even find it if I wanted to. But I, I, get over the, I get over the fence and I get a track uh, in a school property that sits off a union and uh -huh. Bosco alerts to one of the portables and I look under there and there's this kid, he's probably 110 pounds, just terrified. So he didn't sink when he went no, through that. No, not at all. He ran right on top. We actually joked about it later. I was like, bro, did you sink in that? And he was like, no, I didn't sink in what? And I'm like, you should <laughs> you know, Got home, like told my wife that one. I'm always like, can you stop going into swamps? Like, you know? <laughs> but, and to my backup's credit, like patrol, they don't, they don't get it. Like, this is right. what I signed up for yeah. right. mm -hmm. to them. I think it's nuts. Like I'm not doing that job, mm -hmm. but like, Hey man, where they go, we go. It's just, you know, that's what I love about canine is, you know, is the whole idea. Like, you know, I, I grew up Christian. I grew up in the church and there's a lot of times about, uh, canine that I would equate that to, um, there was a passage in the book of Isaiah. It said like, you know, here am I, send me. Right. Mm -hmm. Who's going to go chase these guys and who's going to go, you know, fight for this guy, whoever. And granted, it's a victim of a car theft. They got insurance, whatever. But right. and that's petty. Right. But there are sometimes yeah. true victims of crimes yeah. where like, who's going to go chase these guys in the unknown? Like, put me in coach. I'm, I got this guy. Right. You know what I mean? I love that aspect of canine. Mm -hmm. That's um, the thing I don't think people realize too. Like they, they see that image of you guys with the dog and everybody loves dogs. So they don't realize what you guys actually go through. Yeah, right. And like when I went through the march or the marsh with you guys and Tony LaRusso was talking to all of the guys trying out and was like, this is what you're signing up for. We're coming in here loud as can be, you know, they will see you before you see, yeah. uh, you know, they will see before you see them. And that is what you're signing up for. Do you know that? Yeah. Does, you know? And I was like, wow. Like that was so eye opening to me. I was like, that is not what I thought canine was. Yeah, and for sure. And that's, and that's one of the, you know, during my time, I know I, I knew I wanted to be in canine went all through FTO and all that, but I think it was in, um, man, forgive me. I think I want to say it was 2008, maybe 2007 when Matt Williams um, and his dog, the OG were killed in Polk County. Mm -hmm. It's the first law enforcement funeral I went to. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I think some people might look at that scenario and be like, I would never do canine. And I was like, I have to do that job. Right. I have to. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know? uh, but along those lines, I mean, not only going into the unknown, but also going after the unknown. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, you got somebody that flees, they bail out of the car, you don't know what they got. You don't nope. know who they are. Uh, you don't have the luxury. That's what, And that's what is different about SWAT, right? Because when SWAT does a warrant, they know everything about these people. They've been doing surveillance for months, right? They know exactly when they come and go, who goes in the house, what they do, their complete background, what criminal charges they have. They know everything about these people. Mm-hmm. Canine, like, where's my start point? <laughs> you have no idea if they're armed, if they're not, if they're scared, yeah. if they're going to fight. They, you have no idea. You just trust that your dog's going to take care of you and that if you're lucky enough to have a backup, that the backup squared away. Mm-hmm. And that hopefully you got some angels on your side to, to get you through it. And that's, you just go, you know, there's mm-hmm. no room for fear yeah. in canine, you know. It's pretty wild. Yeah. It is. So Bosco retires. Yeah, I think he retired in 2018. Okay. And I went to test uh, dog for my second dog. And I had the idea I wanted to name the dog Kaiser. I wanted, another, I wanted a big all black shepherd. Mm-hmm. All right, they're so cool looking. You know, I wanted another big black shepherd. So I go to the uh, facility we test at, which is uh, police service dogs in, uh, over in Ocala, Oxford, Florida, really. Um, and so they bring out this big black shepherd. I'm like, that's the guy. <laughs> And he failed every task oh. we gave him. Like, oh. I'm like put that dog. Looked inside, pretty, you know? couldn't perform. And, yeah. Yeah. Oh. And then I bring out this skinny mal, and he jumps <laughs> up at me and like puts his head in my chest, and I'm like, "All right, little fella." And, you know, the mals are generally really loving dogs until the wires connect. They want to murder everyone. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> I was gonna but, say, but, yeah, like, yeah. they scare the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're very loving dogs, and so like, all right, let's run this guy through it, and he just test after test just killed it hmm. and so me and tony were testing dogs at the same time tony has seniority over me he's been in the canine unit a lot longer um and so um you know tony walked out of track uh you know test taco on tracking and mouths traditionally are a little bit harder on tracking they like to yeah. leave their head up and area search a lot of the track they're easily distracted sometimes they take a lot of work on tracking and taco just had his nose down and went 30 paces grabbed the toy I'm like let's do that again I did it again. And normally like you test all the dogs and there's a debate of who wants what dog. And you talk about seniority rules. Yeah. After the second track, I sprinted taco to my car and threw him in. I was like, this is my dog. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I think Tony initially was interested at taco as well. But when, when he tested uh, a black and tan dog that is now Logan, yeah. he was like, Oh, that's my dog. You know? So I didn't yeah. take anything from Tony at all. Good. And looking back, I had to do a lot of work to Taco with Taco to get him to track. Mm-hmm. Where Logan was a plug and play dog, you know. I I, th- I think I think afterwards Tony was like, "Thank God I didn't take that mouth." You know? <laughs> but I had to work really hard to get Taco to, to be the tracking dog that he was. Which again goes back to my point of what you put in, you will get out. Mm-hmm. You know, I worked really hard with Taco, and uh, you know, it was pretty cool looking back on this dog that jumped in my arms, you know, and then blew all the testing away. And I'm like, I have to work this dog. And, you know, fast forward five years after I picked him, he ends up saving my life. You know, yeah. so. Now, before we get to that, how did Kaiser yeah. become Taco? Or was Kaiser only for the big oh, black yeah. shepherd if you got yeah, that? Yeah, this skinny little mouth came in named Kaiser. You know what I mean? And so, like, there's no way. He can't live up to it, right? He's skinny little mouth. He's and like your daughter, your daughter named him Taco? <laughs> yeah. Right? So I came home and, uh, you know, I sent pictures to my wife, like, hey, this is the new guy, you know, this skinny, like, little black mask and a skinny mm-hmm. yeah. little dog. Uh-huh. Like, it can't be Kaiser. I need some names. So I get home. My daughter, uh, I think she was five at the time. Like, I need some names. And she's like, pizzeria. I'm like, that's <laughs> stupid. No, like, no. <laughs> what else I got? And she goes, she goes, uh, Taco Bell. I'm like, no, it's like Taco. I'm like, oh, shit, man, that might be. That kind of works. Mm-hmm. That might be good, right? <laughs> and so, right to it. Yeah, and so... Yeah, and then you guys hijacked his name, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Taco yeah. Tuesday, it was right? Like, it was hard to resist. Taco Tuesday. It's yeah, a great I feel like name. Yeah, I made a lot of money in overtime, man, because Ryan, Ryan Gordon would call me and be like, "Hey, uh, <laughs> hey, can you come down to pictures?" Like, yeah. absolutely, yeah. man. It's two right there, home, right? Yeah. right there. Yeah, I'll but that, tacos. Yeah, so I mean, my wife, my whole family, we have. I mean, we have. No one calls him Taco. We have a thousand different names for him, you know. Oh, but yeah. like, what are some of those names? That's how it is. Uh, yeah. It's either Talk, Tickers, Slippy, Slappy. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you get where do you get that TikTok? I mean, when there's, oh, yeah. yeah, there's they have oh, a thousand yeah. amount. I think calls thing. him. He only gets taco when he gets. In, it's like when you're yelling at your kid and you use them the full mm. name. It only gets called taco when he's being bad. You know? Right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Tickers is probably the biggest one. Be <laughs> was yeah. he one of the first full mouths that we had? Yeah, that was kind of no. So the first school that I ran, um, Wyeth Whitehurst, John Har, and Paul Martin was taking his second dog, and I was told. Um, do not pick any mouths. There's this belief that the mouths are more aggressive or more violent than the shepherds. 
Oh, granted, like, are mouths, you know, known for their fighting and then their aggression? Like, a little bit. I think they're a little bit crazier. You know, German Shepherd is a little bit more mild-mannered, a little bit more, uh, let's, be, let's be honest, mouths are stupid, right? And the wires connect, and whatever they're holding on, they're going to thrash and kill, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, that goes down. But they're fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it goes back to the handler, right? It goes right. back to the handler. The handler is responsible for the dog. Like, so, and to put it bluntly, like, we train our dogs to bite everyone they find. We decide if the dog can bite or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we can't let the dogs to, they don't have the ability to think and use reason or logic to understand, like, can I bite this guy? What charges do we have? Like, right. but we right. have to train, like if we didn't train the dogs to, right. under, to, to bite everyone they find, right. he would have not reacted the way he did on March 12th, right? right. Yeah. So can we go there? And there was one German Shepherd that was decent, that was Guinness that we bought for Paul and uh, that Paul picked because he was, he was a prior handler. And then there was two mouths. You know, I kind of fell into that category of these dogs are, are scarier. Yeah. I didn't think they were, you know, but they, I, I mean, I remember because everybody was like, oh, no, they're fine, but it would be like, you know, yeah. so I, I don't know if it was Taco, but one of the other mouths, like I was just standing there, he was just sitting there looking at me. I'm like, you are yeah. unpredictable, right? <laughs> they are, so they are, they they are but again, like King standing there looking at you like, yeah, but again, I am, so I'm very hard on my dogs because I understand this is an animal that can make his own decision. And mm -hmm. if they choose yeah. to bite, they can cause a lot of damage very quickly. Big and teeth, so, small brain. Exactly. A hundred percent. That's yeah. a perfect way, right? So yeah. in order to make a mal, you, you, you combine a German Shepherd and a Raptor and that's a mal, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so like, uh, oh, this is the best dog that he has for the money we're going to spend. Mm -hmm. And with the way we train these dogs, I don't care if it's a Shepherd or a mal, we're going to make him a good police dog. Yeah. And to our point, it worked. Like John Har is working Tyson. And Tyson is, I would argue, one of the best dogs we've ever had. He's a mal, you know? So, mm -hmm. like, again. Any major catches you're super proud of before we talk yeah. about March 12th, like between Bosco or, or Taco? Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's a couple. One that sticks out with, with Bosco, and it's a real long story. And I'm going to shorten it, you know, there's cliff notes. But um, remember, it was, uh, it was in January of 2013. It was freezing cold. It was definitely probably down in the 30s, 20 mile an hour wind. No one's doing anything. I was sitting at Mike's... Uh, um, St. Mike's there in Dunedin, mm -hmm. just like waiting for the night to end. So I just go home. It's just freezing, you know, and when it's cold out, you turn your heat on and you're trying to balance, turn your heat on and not turn your heat alarm on, but then, then you're going to fall asleep with the heat on. So right. it's like, you know, just trying to survive the night. Right. And uh, a call comes out for a home invasion. And usually home invasions are nonsense. Like, right. like to the people in Pinellas kind of like, like five guys in ski masks are going to come break into your house and ask for the safe. Right. That's not a thing. Right. Right. That happens because you're dirty <laughs> and you're slinging. Right. right? And yeah. they know, they know about you. Right? right. Now I'm sure that happens as random, but they know something about you. Mm -hmm. Right. So in this case, um, there's a lady in Dunedin and, uh, she described that she heard an explosion, which was her front door being kicked in. And before she could even sit up to see what it was, someone jumped on top of her and was choking her and was trying to kill her. Um, and so this is the call that she just been attacked. And so I, I get to the call and I'm like, well, hopefully this guy's on scene because there's no way we can track, right? Because high winds, uh, it really defeat your track, yeah. you know? And so the cold weather can sometimes help, but the, the high winds definitely, there's no way we're tracking this guy. And I got there, uh, true fears on her face. Like she's wrapped in her comforter and her eyes are just massive and she can barely speak. And I'm like, you know, and she's got marks all over her neck and stuff. I'm like, okay. This is legit, yeah. This is legit. And like the doors hanging off, front doors hanging off. I'm like, where did he go? And she pointed on the other side of the sidewalk. And like, and she pointed the, like which direction he ran, can barely speak. And I was like, I need you to go back inside and wait for the other deputies because I'm not waiting for a perimeter. I have to go right now, right? And she was like, I cannot go back in there. And so her neighbor came outside and was like, and I'm like, hey, do you know her? She's like, yeah, like she's got attacked and she's staying in your house. I'm like, yeah. So she goes there, I get Bosco out. And it's one of those like, I'm finding this guy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hurt this guy when I find him, you know? So I get Bosco out and I'm like, please get a track, man, come on. And so if someone runs on the sidewalk, um, let's not go there. I don't wanna give any tips to, sus to suspects, okay. right? <laughs> so I get a track. Good idea. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Bad if they guys, were smart, should you go in, on the sidewalk or should you not go on the yeah. sidewalk? Yeah. We'll so, never know. Don't run from the cops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always that. <laughs> so I, I get a track and Bosco was a very fast tracking dog, a full mm -hmm. sprint. And as soon as I hit it, I'm like, you're done, dude. I got you. Once Bosco was locked in, it's a wrap. Mm -hmm. Unless you get in a car, I got you, you know? And so we track and I get up to Pinell's trail, lose the track for a little bit, trying to figure it out. Cause Pinell's trail is now a lot more pavement, trying to work it. I eventually get it going in a certain direction. And as I'm tracking, a Lieutenant calls out and is like, Hey, I got a subject running down the street wearing no shoes and a t-shirt and boxers. I'm like, yeah, I'm wearing a, like a beanie and gloves and two layers, grab him. 
right? And so he, he secures them. I continue the track. And as I come out to uh, Douglas Ave in Sunset Point, I'm Doug, yeah, around Douglas Ave in that Sunset Point area, um, there's a business there, Dunedin Refrigeration, and Bosco turns and, like, launches himself in the bushes. And I, you know, give him attack command to, like, just kill this dude, man. And go in, and Bosco comes in and out. There's no one there. So it's a hot spot. He was hiding there for sure, yeah. right? And so I shot my flashlight at the lieutenant. I'm like, where'd you see him come at? He's like, right where you are. I'm like, that's him. Put him in a car. And so, they, you know, with two investigations, we figure out, you know, there, there was a sweatshirt that Bosco found in the trash can door on the track. The suspect's sister identified that was a sweatshirt he left, uh, he was wearing tonight. She's like, does it have a hole in the sleeve? And check those holes in the sleeve. Like, this is him. And so, you know, he, he, goes, to, he goes to jail. We put him in for uh, burglary battery. Um, so there's burglary battery of like punching someone through a down window, which is a third degree mm -hmm. felony. There's burglary battery, which is a first degree felony up to 25 years. It's like, uh, who's trying to kill her, you know? Yeah. And so, um, so the case agent ended up going for narcotics and was really kind of absent of the whole investigation. State attorney called me, the, the ASA called me and he says, uh, so I got this case and uh, my boss wants me to no file this because there's no evidence of him being in the house. But how confident are you are that this is the guy? I'm like, this, this is the guy, I promise you. Mm -hmm. My dog is surgical tracking, this is the guy. And the sweatshirt ties him to this and that. And so to the credit of the uh, assistant state attorney, his name is Diego Navais, he works for the US attorney now. But uh, uh, he was like, can I meet you out at the track and walk me through this track? Because I don't know anything about dog, dog tracking or how they work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked him through the track and everything and just put it all together. And he was like, this is the guy. I'm like, 100% it is, man. Mm -hmm. Dude, I, fight this, man. This is him. And so we worked together to build this case against this guy. Um, I testified once. I spent about three hours on the stand, most of it teaching the jury how dogs track, mm -hmm. you know, and, and getting them to understand. There's no evidence at all. That, that led him into the house. And um, we got a guilty verdict, he got 25 years. Um, and then he threw up an appeal because there was a rapist in Pinellas County that Claudio DeMundo had caught with his dog right around the same time that my victim was attacked. Mm. And so the jury wasn't preview that information. And so they threw up an so appeal. So there's like a similar case that you, you have to notify the jury. Yeah, it's called a reverse Williams rule and that's what uh, the appellant judge eventually said like, hmm. well, the jury should have been made aware of that. So they did, oh. a, they did, a, gave the guy a new trial. I testified again to that. And this time they went through all of his property that hadn't gone, hadn't been gone through before. Uh -huh. And they found pretty much a manifesto of the suspect saying all the things he wanted to do when he broke into her house. And no one had noticed that the first no one time had noticed around. That. Nope. No one had gone through it at all. Oh, wow. And so, uh, yeah, we put it all together. So, um, so then they made a deal with, uh, the suspect that if he pleads guilty, he'll get 25 years. If he pleads not guilty and goes back, they're gonna ask for life. Mm. And so then COVID hit and a bunch of other stuff happened. I believe he's, he's in prison, but I don't think he's doing a life sentence. I think they just, you know, they get just end up going down to plea bargains and plea bargains. But either way, uh, that was one of those cases where I was like, this is why I got into K9. Yeah. To fight for yeah. people who can't fight for themselves, you, right? And you, you got typically to, don't get to go through that no, entire right, process right. like that, right? And this right? was so cool because you typically don't, right? You yeah. catch the guy and you just hope the best outcome. Yeah. And yeah. really a lot of credit goes to the the ASA who said, I, is this the guy? I don't want to know follow this. Like just, just yeah. done. He was a younger attorney and just like, is this the guy, man? And we just, we worked really well together and, you know, put a legit bad guy in jail. And what's crazy is during the trial, you know, I'm like, is this the guy that I screw up? Like, and you start doubting yourself. Sure. Mm -hmm. And Diego, when he was doing, the suspect actually wanted to take the stand. And Diego um, had a, his, his, you know, yellow notebook that he was writing in. Um, he has yellow, you know, paper pad, whatever. And he had, is this your sweatshirt written on there with a big circle around it? It's like, it's Hail Mary. If I feel like I'm losing, I'm going to ask it. Yeah. And so he threw it at him. And the guy says, yeah, it's mine. I, I, I took it off and threw it in a trash can, but that was, that was months ago. Of course, the jury was like, dude, you're so full of it, mm -hmm. right? And he also admitted to hiding in the bushes at Dunning Refrigeration saying he had, he had to pee. But like the jury, I think when the jury heard that, plus with my testimony, they were like, it's a wrap, dude. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, I, but even still, I'm like, I mean, the last thing I want to do is. Yeah, you, you want to put the wrong guy And there. the guy had yeah. never been arrested before. Didn't have, didn't have a parking ticket. I'm like, I mean, am I wrong here? And the second time we, you know, I testified and then they found that manifesto. I'm like, yeah. hell yeah, Bosco. Like. So, so you have been such a killer stalking dog, her, man. thinking about her for a while. Yeah. yeah so actually she was, uh, she was a manager of a pizza place in downtown Dunedin. Mm -hmm. She was good friends with uh, a girl that worked at um, Casatina in Dunedin. Mm -hmm. um, my victim purchased the house and had like a housewarming party. 
the girl in Castina, uh, she was invited. She brought her brother, who ended up being my suspect, mm -hmm. and he developed this infatuation with uh, my victim wow. and stalked her for a little bit. And then one day decided to boot the door up and try to kill her. Yeah. And her testimony was that when the guy was choking her, she, she started, uh, she bit him and he had a big bite mark on his hand. Like, Hello. how is this not a nail in a coffin? You yeah. know? Right. But, um, but, uh, she, she thought I have to scratch him so they can find my DNA oh, or his yeah. DNA on my fingernails because I'm going to die. thought she was going to die. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to die. This is it. And he was wearing a ski mask and uh, they made eye contact. And as soon as they made eye contact, he freaked out, jumped off, took off running. So she was like, I don't know who he is, but he thinks I know who he is. And that's mm -hmm. why he ran. I think he probably thought she should have died sooner. This is taking a lot longer. And he panicked and took off running, oh. you know? And so, you know, bottom, bottom line is, it's again, like you said, it's very rare that you follow the entire process and yeah. you see the good that you did. Now, granted, she that messed her up mentally for a while. She she, she she bought that house and a year later she sold it and she moved yeah. to another state. Um, but I remember when I went to testify for the second time, she showed up. And I think what happened the third time, she was like, I'm done testifying. I'm done. Every time she's got to rehash it and all that. You know? right. But the second time that uh, I testified um, and I killed it again, I knew the jury, you know, especially jurors love dogs. And a good state attorney is going to mm -hmm. say like, hey, why'd you name him Bosco? Like, oh yeah, he hangs out with her family. And then the jury's like, oh, you know, staring at you like they love, they look at the suspect like, uh -huh. you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you know? you know? And so I knew, so it came up to me, bawling her eyes, I'm going to be a big hug. And I'm like, you saved my life. And I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, like I love this job. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so to do it. yeah, for sure. Yeah, because if we figure, I mean, canine, you know, like some of the other specialty units, you don't, I mean, even, even less so than patrol that, you know, patrol obviously get more involved depending on what it is or it goes IOB or, or whatever. But I mean, you guys are really far removed. So that yeah. is definitely yeah. a, a cool thing to be able to. Yeah. And sometimes like sometimes detectives will say, it's funny, we'll sit at like, a, like K and I used to go to award ceremonies sometimes and you'll hear like burglary will get the, uh, you know, unit achievement award because they, they stopped like 30 burglaries or whatever. And they start telling the story and we'll look around and we're like, Tony, that was your catch. <laughs> Tony didn't get a thing, you know? <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know? But you know, it is but again, like, can I, we care less about the medals, right? Yeah. We get 30 catches a year and we're super proud of our dog and we care less about the, about the medals, you know? So, and really to the point, like that's our job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's our job is to go in the places the deputies don't want to go to. So, yeah. you know, that's enough for us. That's good stuff. Yeah. All right. March 12th. March 12th. So, um, and I think, um, like I said, I, I want to talk about really the aftermath and, and, I think it's a really good picture of what folks have to deal with yeah. when they experience this sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm just going to do just a quick and dirty, and then we'll kind of keep it keep it simple yeah. on that instead of re rehashing everything. Sure. Because yeah. again, we've we've been there, done that. But it does speak to kind of that uh, that unknown that you're going. You know, when I did the intro, I said a re a routine track with a little bit of sarcasm because there is no routine. You guys are yeah. going in there after the unknown uh, call came out. Uh, somebody committing vehicle burglaries in daylight, which. Yeah, it was daylight savings. Not not ideal. Yeah. Uh, and you you respond, and uh, Sergeant Viano was working Squad Two. This was down in Squad One. Yes, close. Yeah, Squad One. Was Pinellas, yeah. I think it's unincorporated Pinellas Park. Yeah. yeah. So for whatever reason, Jake just says, "Yep, I'm going to go." He he was uh, you know K9 for a long time. A lot of other things. And I will say though, your your video, I thought it was really cool. Uh, for the award, we were talking about how, you know, you kind of idolized Jake and, and yeah, canine at the time. Yeah. So it just so happens, this is just how it's going. Uh, he decides to come run with you. Uh, you guys really don't go that far into the track. You go over a couple fences, uh, come around the corner, and uh, there he is. You go down uh, three shots, and, um, you know, Taco uh, just grabs the guy yep. and yep. was definitely the, you know, you're you're definitely not here. Jake's probably not here without Taco. Taco 100%. holds him. Yeah. Jake fires, uh, takes care of business, and um, they got you. Ran the whole call, got you taken care of, got you out of there on your way to the hospital. Yeah. Um, and it really, it is really incredible um, for our perspective. I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I think I'm from our perspective because we are out there talking about canine, talking about the things we do, promoting training, promoting all these things, and this is truly one of those situations. You can call it luck. You can call it divine event. Whatever you want, everything's aligning perfectly yeah. for you to still be here. Yep. Uh, and for Taco to do what you trained him to do, you've sat here, you've told us how committed you are to training and to making all this stuff happen. And, and now I, I didn't even really know the story about how Taco was picked. So, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. even more like this. Yeah. This is why Taco is here. So that yeah. you're still here. So that Jake's still here. Yep. So you have that whole thing. You're shot in the <laughs> wrist. 
uh, the thigh, and then the neck. The thigh is good to go. Yeah. yeah. Through and through. I didn't know I got shot in the thigh until I think the it was I think it was the second day after the surgery. You know, from what I remember, I might be completely way off because my wife still tells me stuff about the days in the hospital. I'm like, mm. that happened? You know, <laughs> yeah. Like, mm-hmm. The it's a hell of a drug, right? <laughs> like, you, know, you know, but they like, they went to like change my bandage on my leg. I'm like, I had no idea I got shot in the leg. But I went through and through the meat, didn't hit my bone or the artery. Um, nice. You know, deputies didn't know that at the time. They were completely right to put a tourniquet on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I had no idea. I had zero complications with it. Mm-hmm. Like, literally put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. Right. <laughs> you know? And the, yeah. the neck was a was a tough one. That was yeah. another one where you were neck extremely was fortunate. Yeah. The neck still is a tough one. You right. know? So the round went under my left ear. It passed through my neck. I think when people hear I got shot in the neck, they think of like a graze. And like, but no, it went through and through my neck, went through my left side, came out my right side. Um, the round was a hollow point. It was a Hornady uh, home defense mm. hollow point. And so mm-hmm. it, the round did its job to fragment yeah. and cause as much damage as possible. And so when it hit the it hits, um, C2, so a second vertebrae, it fractured, it went through C2. That's when the bullet pretty much exploded. Uh-huh. And most of it got stuck in the bone. There's a three millimeter piece that got stuck in the meat and the rest of it came out under my right ear. So because the, the bullet came out so much smaller than it went in, I have a pretty decent scar on my left side, but not really much on my right side. Mm-hmm. Um, but it definitely, it did some nerve damage in there. You know, that still, it doesn't ruin my day, but every so often there's times where like, oh, shit, there it is, yeah. you know. And there's still pieces in there, right? There's still pieces yeah. in there. Yeah, the ones that are in the, in the bone, they're like, we're never even gonna touch that. It's way yeah. too dangerous, we'll call it. That's the best it's, it's gonna get. The one that's, the, it's three millimeters that's stuck in my neck, you know. They've talked about taking that out and just seeing, you know, cause they can't do an MRI. So they don't know exactly where it's laying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know, it's not, it's not awful. You know, I think if I do a lot of activity, if I do like a shoulder day and I do a lot of traps, it'll, it'll bother me the next day, but like nothing that I can't. Nothing worth going in there rooting around. No. Yeah. And it really <laughs> be exploratory yeah. surgery, right? I mean, yeah. cause they could do yeah. a CAT scan and based on a CAT scan, do measurements and go and grab it. But, um, the fear is that it's somewhere near my, my, um, occipital nerve. Mm-hmm. And so the occipital nerve, uh, starts in your head and goes down in your traps and all that. So. The bottom line is for me, it's like, you know, I'd rather deal with the slight pain that I have than they start doing surgery and something happens to that nerve That's and worse. I lose the right. ability to use my right mm-hmm. side in any way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what? I, you know, some, and, and the pain's not so much that I can't say like sometimes I feel it and I'm like, whatever, bro, I'm still alive. I still won. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So a lot of it is like a reminder of, dude, you're still alive. Act like it, you know? Right. So. And then the wrist. Yeah, the wrist is, uh, it's, and the wrist is really the worst one, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Um, the round went in the top of my wrist, um, and it, it pretty much shattered the radius. It came out the bottom of my wrist. Um, it severed the tendon that works my thumb. They didn't think my thumb was going to work again. Um, the surgeon, uh, his name is Christian Mamzak, uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He was incredible. Um, the incisions he made not only saved my tattoo, but he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the important That's part. That's the important is, part, yeah. right? But uh, he put in like a six inch titanium plate and I think there's 11 screws in there holding it together. Um, and then he had to cut my tendon even more so that he could microscopically surgery, uh, you know, put that back together. Uh-huh. And then when I got put in the cast, he, you know, just started giving me exercises. Like, I can't promise your thumb's gonna work again, but right. you know, just keep working at it. Uh-huh. And I just worked my ass off in, in uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy and my thumb is back. You know, I can't feel it. My, I lost all feeling in my thumb, but I have all the strength. And so- um, So you can still win in thumb wrestling. Uh, yeah, probably. Okay. I can't. Yeah. If I, if I couldn't see that I won, I wouldn't know the difference. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, it still works. And, uh, you know, and during the recovery, it was, um, there was a couple of, of, uh, of like hard, like mental setbacks during the yeah. recovery mm-hmm. that I think is, I think is important. You know, one is like, you know, because I know the doctor told me like, if you had not taking care of yourself physically, no way you recover the way you did. Yeah. You know? And how they explain it is like, you know, you, so your body has its own algorithm, right? And so if you are constantly like breaking down muscle fibers and building them back up, like your nerves are strengthening, all these things are happening in, in, in order to, you know, produce muscle and, and, and create all that. So if you don't ever do that and you're injured, your body is a slower process mm-hmm. of yeah. recovering and, and rebuilding those, those muscle fibers yeah. and nerve endings, all that, because mm-hmm. you have not taken care of yourself. Yeah. And, it, and it, you know, God forbid it to be, you know, uh, a shooting or a stabbing, but a car accident, right? I mean, the average person, if you are not taking care of yourself, it's too late, right? Mm-hmm. You didn't put the work in. Yeah. And so your body doesn't already know how to recover. So exactly. Right. Starting yeah. from scratch. Yeah. And so like physical therapy was really difficult. And, you know, I was in a neck brace for three months. 
-hmm. It was really hard. And, um, but the doctors told me I need you to be on a, uh, if you can get a stationary bike or something mm -hmm. just to get the blood moving and get fresh blood to the injured areas. I can't be on a treadmill because I couldn't really walk that well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so, uh, Wyeth Whitehurst and canine, he went to a cross, he belonged to a CrossFit gym, told his guy, Hey, this is what I'm going through. You know, my, my guy's going through, he's the guy that got shot. He was like, give him one on our stationary bike. So I had a stationary bike. And so, um, I'd watch TV, TV while I was doing it, but I really clung to, uh, you know, I never went to the military. Um, like I said, like I was, I was so involved in music. That was the furthest thing from me, but, but with my grandfather, like I've always idolized guys in the military and guys that give yeah. up, you know, give up their, you know, their adolescence for, you know, greater good and serve the yeah. country mm -hmm. and really risk damage through their, you know, mental and physical health and, you know, pursuit of something greater, you know, but, um, so I always had a lot of, uh, you know, you know admiration for those guys. But um, I, uh, Brad Byers, who I was on SWAT with, and he was on, um, he was in K9 with me. He dropped off a book called Perfectly Wounded. And that was written by Mike Day, who was a SEAL, uh, SEAL operator. And Mike, it's called Perfectly Wounded because Mike was shot uh, 27 times um, in one incident over in Afghanistan. So they were, you know, hunting around doing, you know, high value targets. And uh, Mike's number one in the stack. They do an explosive breach on our door, and he goes in and he's just hit with AK rounds from yeah. four insurgents inside. The rest of the team can't come in. Mike gets pushed back into a corner. Um, he got shot 16 times in his chest plate and the rest were around his limbs of his body. So Mike uh, returns fire with his, uh, his handgun and he kills two guys, two headshots and kills both guys. The other two now realize he's still alive. They start shooting him again, but he's on decent cover depending on, I don't know what this place looked like, but he's some decent cover, mm -hmm. but his hand gets shot and the round shatters the, uh, the grip to his, uh, six hour. And so he has no more grip. He reinserts a new magazine that now serves as his grip. And he does two more headshots and kills the other two guys. Wow. And being shot 27 times. So he gets shot in the first chapter of the book, you know? And so it was one of these, like, <laughs> man, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah. yeah. And so I, you know, I, you know, listened to the book on Audible cause I couldn't read, I couldn't, I couldn't bend my neck down, you know, but I read, listened to the book and there's a lot of inspiring things of like, mm -hmm. you know, find an excuse to win whatever it is. And so I really got a lot of, um, encouragement from that book. And then, uh, in April, my dad knew I was reading the book and my dad did some research on Mike day and I got done the book. I told my dad, I got to, he's not like, uh, one of these guys that goes into government after the SEAL teams. He's not a high guy. Like he's an average guy. I got to find him on Facebook and see if I can talk to him. Just kind of let him know mm -hmm. what I'm going through and maybe, you know, just offer some encouragement. And he's mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I didn't want to tell you, but he, he, uh, he killed himself in April. Mm -hmm. And I, that's, for some reason, I still have a hard time thinking about that. I think it, it, it takes me back to when I was uh, in that recovery and just like yeah. a little bit of fear, like, oh, man, he's a SEAL team. Like, what's going to happen to me if, if he mm. couldn't take it, you know? Um, but at the same time, it's one of those like, you know, Mike had a really bad childhood. And he talked about that in his book. There's a lot of demons he didn't deal with before he was shot. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a really good support system, 100%. Right? My parents yeah. are, they just celebrated their 46th wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. You know, they're incredible people. I had an incredible childhood. I'd never won for anything, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I have all the support in the world. I mean, besides my outside family and the canine, you know, my wife is so much stronger than I am, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that is not me, but it definitely brought a little bit of fear of like, what is this road that I'm on? You know, where do I end right. up from yeah. here? You know, but, um, you know, I just, I just made the, made the decision very similar to my decision of I'm going to canine and very similar to my decision of I'm going to move to Florida and get a 4.0 in college as I made a decision of like, you know what, this kid's in the ground collecting worms. I'm alive mm -hmm. and I'm going to beat this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I remember the first yeah. time I, <laughs> yeah, I <like> that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the first time I jogged uh, around the block with not wearing a jog with taco around the block, not wearing a neck brace or anything. And I jogged down the block, which is only about a quarter mile. I came back in the garage and I just bawled my eyes out like, holy shit, I'm going to win this thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to beat this thing. Yeah. So it was very, uh, and Bobby Cahoon, you know, it's got to be said, that guy was at my house every day. Take yeah. walks with me. He'd walk taco, uh, you know, and there was the amount of support that you get. And people don't know. I mean, there are a lot of units that I don't have any, uh, I've never dealt with the spot unit and robbery homicide. I've never dealt with those guys. I don't even know half those guys. Yeah. You know, they take credit for your catches. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Any, yeah any awards they have on their uniform? That's from K9. Yeah. 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 You know, but the amount of support and the amount of donations, the amount of public cards and gift cards and mm -hmm. food that was dropped off, 
I mean, it's insane to, I mean, to really talk about the family of law enforcement, the mm. brothers and sisters that wear the star and that wear the shield in mean, different municipalities, Lagra SWAT, Tampa SWAT, Pinellas, uh, Pinellas Park SWAT, mm. all the different canine teams. There are U.S. Marshals at the hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, when one of us goes down, it's mm -hmm. like everyone gathers together like, this is, this is why we got in this job, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so a lot of the, my recovery is like, like I'm going to, uh, number one, I'm going to be better for me and my family. But number two, like I'm going to be better for all those guys that came out to the hospital to support me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for Jake, this whole thing is not going to be in vain. He saved my life. And, mm -hmm. and my job is to live the best life I possibly can now that I'm given a second chance. You know? mm -hmm. And so, and it's tough not being in canine because that's my passion, but um, I am very eager looking at what the road is ahead, you know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the recovery from something like this is, uh, it's difficult physically and mentally, you know, because it definitely changes you, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and one of the things that was really difficult, uh, because my daughter was nine when this happened. Yeah. And it's not like she was two and, you know, right. she's not, a, she, she's not aware. She's none the wiser, right? Yeah. At nine, you know, my wife got the phone call from Justin Feinberg, you know, which is complete against policy. Like, <laughs> you know, and studying for the sergeant's test, we're at how it's supposed to go. And it's, they can not your own family you know what I mean and the thing yeah. is, is like and I and I have nothing against it, like from really all the administrators are considered to be friends um, but like you know Major Lazarus doesn't know my wife yeah. I don't want him calling you her. want your own to take I care want, of your yeah, own I want the canine guys because yeah. yeah. we're all a family Justin mm -hmm. John Claudio right. you know Wyeth all these guys I know their wives I know their kids Megan's yeah. friends with their wives like right. it should be from Justin right you know yeah. policy goes out the window and that kind of stuff you know? right so absolutely so Justin called Megan and was like hey no bull I just got shot you know and, and Ellie was in the room and at some point Ellie figured out that I got hurt and yeah. whatever so you know Ellie's in the hospital and with me and, and there's there's pictures of us I know you guys put up the, the mm -hmm. Rays game that like her and I walking in the hallway which was brutal but I want her to know like you ain't gonna beat me man I'm strong yeah. like we're right. fine yeah. and internally just like my gosh, this is ridiculous. That was close, yeah. But she, um, yeah, one of the one of the that was really tough how her little mind works is uh, she goes to a private school in, in Pinellas and she came downstairs before bed and like I couldn't hug her for bed. She was kind of leaning into me, you know. I'm, I'm in a cast and I can't really do anything with my neck. But she's like, um, we're learning about forgiveness in school and how do I forgive the guy that did this to you? Mm. Mm. Ooh, so, big things for a nine year old to be thinking yeah, about. Yeah, it's very unfair for kids to have to deal with adult problems, yeah. right? Um, and, and it was just one of those, like, you know, baby, we have to, we have to give him just like Christ forgave us and, you know, holding up the Ouija board, you can send him a message. There it is. Yeah. 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 I mean, holding you on stole to that. My, you yeah. said I couldn't make a joke like that. Come on. <laughs> Earlier. Yeah. <laughs> well, like holding on to that kind of yeah. anger, that'll destroy you, man. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and bottom line, like I said before, like he's in the ground, he's gone. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it worked itself out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so we have to move on. There is life after this, and we're going to be fine. But it's hard for a nine-year-old to understand those kinds of things, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But, um, but and, and, and truth be told, like, um, I'm very, one, of, one of the things I'm very proud of is I have forgiven Zion. I have. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is, like, but I feel bad that he was lost. Look, look at his upbringing. Look yeah, at his background. I, mean, I don't think he had it. If he did have someone to tell him this is not the right way to live, like, he didn't listen, or maybe he didn't have anybody. Yeah. You know, what was really frustrating for me is my wife is a... a like professional Facebook stalker. She'll never <laughs> post anything, but she can find anything on anyone. You know, and she's it's been a following. Lot of women. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Might be efficient yeah. in the ILP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she's been following uh, Zion's mom and Zion's idiot friends. Most of them, a couple of few of them have been killed after, uh, after the shooting. And they were posting stuff about me and uh, our threat. And TIS mm -hmm. guys went and hunted all those guys down. Uh, one guy's probably going to be doing a uh, pretty good amount of time in prison. Mm. Uh, one of the guys got killed in a shooting, not really to law enforcement down St. Pete. Like they're all idiots and Zion surrounded himself around idiots. Zion was captured by one of our canines six months before me and him met. Really? Yeah. Uh, and he got, a, he got a straight attack. So he knew what time it was. He knew <sighs> he was going to get bit, you know, but, um, but yeah. So one of the things that really kind of infuriated me of, I can forgive Zion for what he did. Right. Mm -hmm. But my, my wife had found on March 12th, there's a memorial for, for Zion. I mean, like four people showed up. Right. But like his mom was one of them. His mom was one of them. Yeah. Right. His mom is there. And one of his idiot friends is there in a picture, lifting, lifting up a shirt and showing off a gun. <sighs> and she's in the so picture. It continues. Like, wow. you, like, so you're supporting this. Yeah. This is why your son was killed. The exact same stuff that's going on. And mm -hmm. I think it's kind of hilarious. Like the guys that, you know, want to embrace this thug lifestyle and they go on Facebook and they show the guns that they have. Like, 
posers, man. Like I sometimes think about like like old school mafia in New York City. If mm. Facebook was a thing, you'd think they'd be showing off Tommy guns. Like, right. no. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Professional, yeah. right? And I and it's funny because like when I was working Baskins, there was a there was a guy, his name was Markeem Prim. And Markeem, you know, he's a player, he's a drug dealer and everything else. But uh but when you caught him, he was like, you know, most stuff you don't catch me for. He caught me this time. All right, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was like, and he never you know, never drove like a fancy car, never threatened, you know, never flashed anything, mm -hmm. never flashed any guns. He was a quiet professional criminal. Yeah. You know, he was killed in, in Greenwood a few years after I left Baskins, you know, but he was one of those guys that were very respectful. He was like, hey, do you have your job and I have mine. I make right. more money than you yeah. do, but whatever, you caught <laughs> me, you know, but like these guys out here that play this, you know, thug lifestyle, it's, it's a game. Man. It's a joke. Yeah. And they're posers, not true criminals, you know. I mean, they're breaking into cars at midnight and taking off running. Again, true think they're predators and how quickly they became prey yeah. you know and zion you know thinking he was a predator when he when he shot me how quickly he was like oh man i, I definitely bet off more than i can chew when he's got you know 68 pound mouth hanging off of him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a stud like jake viano firing rounds at him you know mm -hmm. he had no answer for that yeah. he had no answer for for a taco or jake like he fired six rounds and missed three of them and knew like well that's it for me you know and i don't think some people said this is a suicide by cop i don't think so I think Zion was willing to kill anyone that was going to try to take him to prison. Yeah. He was facing a five-year sentence, and he was he was writing checks he can't cash. Bottom line, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. So I'm. But in in short, to my daughter's question, I have forgiven him. You know, because yeah. I want peace in in my life, in my family's life, and I know that's the you know, that's the Christ-like thing to do is to move on. And in order to have any kind of happiness, you have to you know move on. And that, it's just poison, right? I mean, that's just going to yeah. poison you and make you angry. And so I move on. And I'm hoping that through, because Jake and I got invited to go teach at a couple of big seminars this summer, um, just really a debrief. Um, mm -hmm. Our hope is to really educate um, handlers on the importance of training ambush trainings and, and not even just ambush trainings on the handler, but like your backups, you know? Right. Teaching and, people how to accompany you on yeah. the track. Yeah. And as canine supervisors, are you prepared? What steps do you have in place in case one of your guys go down, right? And so there's a lot to learn from this and we're going to take this awful situation and turn it around and offer some classes on, you know, yeah, this I, kind of stuff. I, and the ambush stuff is, is crazy, obviously because of what you all face with the nature of what you do. But yeah. there's a lot of conversations, I think, around law enforcement uh, when it comes to when, when law enforcement officers are encountering anybody. Yep. Uh, and you know, well, do they do they overreact? Do they this? Do they that? And yeah. it's like, well, th this is really one of those situations. You know, it's it's daytime. Yeah, it is the most common crime in Pinellas County. <laughs> it is. Yep. You guys have <laughs> bags run from you all the time. Yep. There's nothing abnormal about this. Yeah. You don't come around the corner guns blazing. No. No. And, and you yeah. you wouldn't normally you unless you knew yeah. this person was armed or, or whatever circumstances. Yeah. So <laughs> the one time that you're not ready. Yeah. That same thing applies to people doing everyday stuff. I mean, this is the th these are the things that law enforcement that they're facing, and you're seeing a situation with this particular family where, yeah. and and I actually really I think it's remarkable the way you look at it. Yes. Um, not the forgiveness piece. They kind of get that because it is a moot point. Yep. Yeah. But but more so the fact that yeah, I mean, this is what he came up in. This is what I came up in. This is the environment he was in. This is the environment I'm in. Yeah. You could have been, anybody could be in that position, basically. Yeah, two uh, guys that weren't supposed to meet, for sure. Right, mm -hmm. you know? and it just, I think it really speaks to the importance of training and, and, and answers a lot of, it should answer a lot of whys for people as yeah. far as how law enforcement takes care of business sometimes. Yeah, and I've had, you know, people that have watched the video, um, you know, I try to avoid, you know, comments on, because most of our are super supportive, you know. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, definitely avoid the comments. Yeah, the so dumbest silly, people in the planet are for on sure. Facebook. Yeah. But like, there's been there's been some questions. Even I think even from some deputies, like, man, why would you just round the corner like that though? Because I'm a SWAT guy, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the tactics you learn in SWAT, you know, don't pass danger areas to get to danger areas around your corner. If you do that on K9 traction, you'll find anybody. Well, but also you go at the pace of the dog. You, you, you know? said it earlier, SWAT. <laughs> has plenty of time to study yeah, a team up of on, guys on, too, what, right? they're, on like, what they're going to do. And they like, know who they're coming up on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the moment that you come around the corner and it's little old lady, you know, picking her daffodils or whatever bull that she has in her backyard, yeah. then it's like, oh, it's police brutality because he came around the corner with a gun. Like, yeah. Well, and the thing is also, like, if I round on the corner at full length of lead, right, and I work taco on a 20-foot on lead oh. um, just based on how he tracks. He tracks much better on a longer lead. But if I had full extension again, if you look at the video, I had a shorter lead because I have a, you know, I have a misdemeanor right now. We don't know if he broke in the car. Right. Mm -hmm. I have a lording and prowling at best. Yeah. 
right? So he ran. I have a shorter length of leash because if I round the corner and, and bite this guy, oh gosh, now I explain a spontaneous mm-hmm. bite. Not that it's a big deal, like whatever. I mean, dogs are going to dogs me faster than you. And the you know, sheriff doesn't care about that kind of stuff as long as it's not a pattern. You can fix mm-hmm. it in training. But still, like, I know how to read my dog. I know I'm close. I can avoid a bite. I will. Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, I round in the corner expecting to see him running. And if I saw him running, I was going to release Tuck at that point. Like, we're yeah. done. Right. And as soon as I round the corner, he's already a shooting stance. So, like, ah, <laughs> you know. Right. And, but like, again, I go back to, you know, you know, jujitsu and some of it. And, and you would think like, how's jujitsu play in this? Right. Definitely didn't help me you know, get shot, <laughs> but understand that, you know, jujitsu, a lot of it is about mindfulness, right? For those five or six mm-hmm. minutes in a round, you are completely focused on one thing, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like a chess match. And so when I, when I dropped in the backyard, um, I tried to set up right, I tried to get up right away. Cause I was like, he just shot me. I'm going to kill this guy. And, but my arms wouldn't move. And the doctor said you were paralyzed for sure. Just from the shockwave mm-hmm. of the round, not the round itself. The shockwave paralyzed my spinal cord. And I couldn't move, and I'm like, oh, man, I just got shot in the head. And rather similar to jujitsu, but I was very calm. I'm like, this is how it goes, I guess. And the black came out from the outside just to get and choked out, and, mm-hmm. and I was knocked out, and I woke up to CPR. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It was one of those, like, I woke up to CPR, like, freaking out a little bit, but like, all right, just breathe, get it going. And there's some similarities that I, that I wanted to point out. There's some really kind of weird things that happen with this shooting. Um, that I don't, I haven't really told many people, but I think it's, an, I think they're kind of unique to, to talk about. So when I got put on the ambulance now, like, you know, the tunnel vision started to open up a little bit more and realizing yeah. like, okay. So Amanda Edinger, um, she was in Kenai at the time. I taught her Kenai school, um, uh, really close friends with her and her husband. Um, my daughter's friends with her daughter. She gets in the ambulance with me and I hear the medics say these pushing of 200 of fentanyl, which is a lot of fentanyl. And I'm like, I'm like, Amanda, where did I get shot? And she's like, you got shot in the neck. I'm like, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh, can, can so I'm you feel thinking, anything below the neck at this point? Can you feel I your toes? I don't recall, but yeah. I, started, I started moving my, my feet like crazy. Because mm-hmm. I've heard that people who are paralyzed, they feel like they are moving, but nothing's moving, mm-hmm. right? And so i moving my toes, and I'm like, are my toes moving? She's like, yeah, they're moving. I'm like, <sighs> all right. And I started, like, freaking out a little bit, right? And so, like... Yeah. Uh, Amanda was like, I need you to look at me. We're going to combat brief together. I think I tried to FaceTime Megan, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> and Amanda's like, do not call her right now. Uh, and then the medic's holding the phone so I can FaceTime her. And Meg, Amanda grabs it from him like, what are you doing, dude? Uh, it's got oh, yeah. bullets She doesn't room, need you know? to see right. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, um, but I thought oh, this is how I die for sure. Right? Yeah. And not knowing that none of my rounds are fatal. I didn't know at the time. But uh, Amanda, you know, snatched my phone. She's like, I need you to look at me. We're in a combat brief together, you know. And I felt like if I looked away from Amanda, yeah, there'd be the Reaper sitting right next to me and that would be it, you know. Mm-hmm. I think if I had looked away from her, I would have gone in the shock, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, during recovery, um, Amanda and Drew, it's, they would come by the house, you know, just like everyone else would, you know. But um, Amanda sent me this, uh, this short little video on Instagram, like an encouragement video. But it was a guy that just said, you know, you know, keep, keep going, keep pushing forward. Today's the day that yesterday you were afraid of facing, but here you are killing it today. Mm-hmm. It was one of those, like, I got this, mm-hmm. right? So during Megan's um, Facebook stalking, <laughs> Megan is my wife, Megan saw, she went on Zion's page. Uh-huh. The last thing that Zion posted before he was killed was today's the day that yesterday you were afraid of facing. Uh-huh. How crazy is that? That's wow. crazy. Yeah. The other thing that's crazy about uh, Zion, Zion was released from prison March 12th of 2022. Mm -hmm. And we met and I got shot by him on March 12th of 2023. Mm -hmm. Exactly a year after prison. Mm -hmm. He's trying to kill two cops. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like like, there was no help on this kid. I really think there was a point where God was like, you're going to die today. Mm -hmm. I give you enough chances. I'm snatching the life out of you today. And Jake Vano's going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. I, I I also think it's interesting the way you say that we met that day. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. I have nothing else to say, but I think it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, this is, this wasn't by happenstance. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like this was written in my life yeah. you know, long before. Like, you know, I almost died before when I was four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Drowning. Yeah. 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 I drowned when I was four. My dad did CPR on me. You know, my dad still has a hard time talking about it, you know, but I mean, but still like, um, I mean, I want to get off this ride. I'm done having CPR done on me. <laughs> <laughs> like, can we be done? Like, yeah. Yeah, my, my uncle was at the hospital a lot. Everyone, I mean, if you don't know Uncle Doug, everyone in the agency knows Uncle Doug. You mm-hmm. know, you can mm-hmm. call him Uncle Doug, you know, but uh, 
But Uncle Doug was like, man, you're like a cat. I'm like, that, man, I got seven more of these in there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm done after yeah. two, man. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, CPR hurts. Did, CPR did you have any ribs, were any ribs broken or your sternum cracked or anything? No. From that? Uh, yeah. Mm -mm. No, the worst part, honestly, the worst part like, about getting shot was the tourniquets. Mm. They're so painful. Mm, I yeah. know. Yes, I, we made we made Ricky Hat put one on oh, the last yeah. time yeah. we had last uh, episode, we had Joey Greco right. on. He put a tourniquet on my arm. Like Jesus, just take the damn <laughs> thing off. Yeah, they're so painful. But they they just the arm, the arm off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take the arm off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember once they took them off. I was not blotted then. Also, once they took them off, I was like, yeah. oh, God, yeah. yeah, they're brutal. Mm. I, I mean, that's how you know they're done right. You know, the guys that um, that that came and helped me, they they did it right. You yeah, know? Um, yeah. So, so, so you got to try fentanyl. What did you think? How was it? <laughs> so it's very short lasting, but like, uh -huh. yeah, I can see why it's so addicting. I would yeah. cook that in a spoon right now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, when I got, I, when uh -huh. I did, like, there was so much going on. Like I had fentanyl just for the ride mm -hmm. and to credit St. Pete and Pinellas Park and, and the sheriff's office, um, for what I was told, ambulance didn't stop once for any light at all. They blocked off every intersection of Bayfront. And then when I got to Bayfront, I remember seeing a trauma team ready to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, yeah. And when that when when that call goes out, mm -hmm. everyone stepped up to the plate. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just crazy. Like you, know, you know. And the thing that is 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 frustrating. I've talked about this in the training. You know, I, I asked for this, right? Between mm -hmm. SWAT and canine, you're you're asking to get mm -hmm. kind of these things. But here's the deal. You, you know, you know the, the deputy does 25 years and takes a retirement, and he works either days or nights, whatever he works. But he hides behind a building, takes the calls. He's the last one to get to the call on purpose. That guy survives his entire career. It's not what you signed up for, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is a violation of the oath that you took with the sheriff and with the state of Florida and for the people of Pinellas County, right? No, I'll be the first. I won't fight for people who can't fight for themselves, yeah. right? When someone calls 911, they should see a deputy who's squared away and ready to, to take care of you. Mm -hmm. You know, anything less than that is it's a violation of your oath, yeah. you know? So whatever, but you know what? And, and there's, there's cops like that all over the country, you know, who are just, they don't want to be first. They want to take the paycheck and go home and do as least as possible. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I think the majority uh, of, of deputies, they want to do the right thing, you know, and they should be taking care of themselves. And when someone calls 911, they should have a deputy walk up to them, but look squared away and they know that they're in good hands, mm -hmm. you know? And so I take that oath seriously, but unfortunately it does come with some consequences, right? you know, and it is, it is what it is, what I signed up for. You know? It is, I mean, the, the, your whole background, I mean, everything you've ever done, you just threw yourself into it and, and got, which is another reason that there should be no doubt that, you could get through that because you just focus on it to get it done. Yeah. And it's just yeah. so interesting to me because so many people in law enforcement that have been through different things, they, you know, family of cops, milit whatever. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. obviously your grandfather, but I mean, this was just, you threw yourself into it and <laughs> yeah. you're just going to be the best at it there is. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, one last thing about this I wanted to ask you about, and, and we can talk about anything else you want, you know, with the back end of it, because law enforcement, I mean, there are obviously law enforcement officers that, go through things that are equally as horrible. They don't get, they end up not getting shot. They still have to work through it. They still have to whatever. But at some point you said something about your perception of yourself versus what other people yeah. see. So, yeah. you know, I, I am just impressed because you're the same Matt that I've always known yeah. for the most part, maybe a little bit more insightful, can have deeper conversation, yeah. but you're the same guy, you know, yeah. you went through yeah. it and your parent, through, which is, you know, you're doing well, but you know, you don't see yourself as, kind of that warrior is that hero piece because of, uh, because of it. No, I don't. It's, it's, it's something that I struggle with, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause part of me, like, um, you know, and it might sound, people might take this the wrong way, but, um, I don't want someone else. I don't want someone to save me, you know? And so even though I know there's nothing I could have done, right. Right. He saw me and heard me and I don't want to give him too much credit, but tactically he did everything right. He drew mm -hmm. me into a fatal funnel and you know, and I got caught and mm -hmm. luckily he's as good of a shot as a criminal and, you know, it hit me fatally. Right? right. But the problem is, uh, you know, I feel like some of this is, I shoulder some of this because I ran right into a gunfight. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm going to joke around with like taco, like, cause Megan would be like, he's so sweet. I'm like, Hey, he walked me right into a gunfight, <laughs> 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 you know, but, but no, I don't see it. And it's, and it's hard because, you know, I, um, you know, I work out here during, during my lunch and, and between classes and stuff. And, you know, and I got to do a better job of some people will ask me like details about stuff. And sometimes I just could be like, dude, I'm just not, mm -hmm. I don't want to revisit. I got to do a better job of that. But, you know, I think people just want to sympathize and they want to, you know, hear, and I think they're impressed that I'm already working out and this and that. But like, it was really tough. Uh, you were doing your job. Yeah. That's what I signed up for. You know what I mean? And I got caught. And so there's a little bit of, 
you know, my, my pride was hurt a little bit, you know, I mean, this, this kid who has zero training, you know, took me out of my game. And so it was, I mean, you know, my pride was hurt a little bit, but, um, I don't see myself as, you know, this warrior or hero. And, and so it was hard because people would write these letters and cards from all over the country and people would give donations and be like, do you, you do the baddest deputy we have like this and that? I'm like, dude, I'm not that guy, man. You know, like I train my dog well and I want to do my job well. And it's just, I'm not that guy, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, you know, I don't know. I think that there's, it was a little frustrating is like so many people were coming to my house and they're dropping off food and dropping off money and dropping off cards. And they want to do the right thing. It's nice. Is anyone going to Jake? <laughs> Jake's the hero in all this. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Right. Like, mm -hmm. and Jake, I mean, Jake, when I was in the hospital and the whole canine unit came in, it was after I had my CAT scan and they knew like he's going to have surgery and this and that. And I'm on Dilaudid and just like flying or whatever. But I knew like Taco's dead. I knew it, you know, and so the whole canine unit's in there. And I'm like, all right, guys, where's my dog? Sent me with it, whatever. And they're like, he's at the vet. He tried to bite the vet. Actually, actually just got kicked out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, Jake took a hostage shot and killed the guy, oh. right? And then he quarterbacked the entire scene. Like, I don't think people were going to Jake's house as much as they were going to mine, mm -hmm. you know? And again, like, everyone knows, like, he's got a long road. We want to make sure his family's taken care of. And I get that. And that's amazing. Jake is the warrior, right? Mm -hmm. Jake is the hero in this whole scene. You know, and so, again, like... I'm very proud of myself for the recovery that I've made. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of myself for keeping my, uh, um, trying to keep my mind strong and maintaining that mental strength that I've been gifted. Um, but it is hard to, uh, people give me something that I don't, I don't want to say don't deserve, but I just feel like this is the job, dude. Right. This is the job. You know what I mean? Like I signed, I signed up for it, you know, and, and I feel like I did it well, but it's, uh, I don't want that credit. Right. You know, I mean, it's just uh, more as a reminder of, and I, and I struggle with a little bit during training. Like if I had just slowed down, if I had slowed down, like would I have been able to get a shot? Um, the problem is that is, um, that is a dark road to go down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't torment no, you yourself can't. with second guessing. Because the bottom guessing. line is like, and, yeah. I, and I learned when I started thinking that a little bit, like I got to be careful how I talk to myself mm -hmm. because Correct. that guy is dead and I'm here. Yeah. So right. I, I teach a, a debrief from this, I mean, Jake do it. And we're going to, that's what the debrief we're going to do in, in the summer. But there's a clip from this guy. His name's Rudy Francisco. You can find him on YouTube. Um, I mean, like anyone that hears this, go to YouTube and type in Rudy Francisco complainers. And this guy is not a cop. He's not a military guy. He's a poet. But he is, um, and we have completely different political <laughs> theories, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we're so different from each other. But I, I, I heard this guy, and then I watched this video when I was um, in recovery. Because sleep wasn't a thing. You know, I couldn't mm -hmm. sleep. I was in so much pain. I just sleep sitting up on a couch and I'd not often wake up to pain, like, and taking every medication possible to make me sleep, you know, like just, just ridiculous, yeah. you know? Um, and there were a couple of things like when I, when I woke up in the backyard and you know, I remember hearing Jake saying like, the worst is over, Maddie, stay in the fight. The worst is over, you know? And so when the, like the, the sun would start to come up after I've been up all night, you'd be like, oh, the worst is over. You know, those, those words like resonate mm -hmm. with me with Jake. But I watched this video um, from Rudy Francisco on complainers. And he talks about like, you know, you know, tell me about your boss, tell me about your traffic, tell me about, you know, you know, the promise you made yourself that you've been, you know, postponing and not completing, mm -hmm. right? How blessed are we to have tragedies so small they can fit on the tips of our tongue, right? And like, you know, is that, you know, you know, whether the glass is half full or half empty, there's water in the cup, drink that and stop complaining. Right? Mm -hmm. And one of the last things he said is, you know, the, the, the human heart beats 4,000 times per hour. And with each beat, each palpitation is a trophy engraved with the words, you are still alive, act like it. Mm -hmm. And so I still, those words still hit me. And every time I do the debrief and I watch that, I'm like, hell yeah, dude. Like I'm still in, I'm still very much in the fight. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so I am, uh, I'm very blessed to still be here. And, um, I think it's a very important that I love that people try to give me that credit and if that, and if that inspires them to maybe be better, that inspires them. Like, Hey, that's the mark. Like he took three bullets and he's out here working out. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be a symbol though. It's hard. And I've always been very humble, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, immersing yourself in martial arts and jujitsu will do that to you mm -hmm. and make you very humble. Um, so I've always, I've never thought of myself as, you know, you know, someone extraordinary, but going through some of the, the readings and some of the videos and some of the uh, recovery, 
one of the things that I heard someone say is, you know, the Romans identified a hero as someone who uh, has endured extraordinary things and then returns to teach those people those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's me and Jake's goal right now yeah. is, is to do that, um, is to discuss ideas of, listen, it's okay when you go through difficult trials in your life to ask for help. You can't muscle through this stuff, right? It's okay to be in therapy for your family, be in therapy after there's trauma, mm-hmm. right? Because your brain can only take so much before it snaps and you might need help and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And I think, feel like that's like a, that's, that's been a staple. I feel like that's, that's breaking a little bit, uh, especially in law enforcement because we've had way too many, and Jana was talking about it and I know mm-hmm. it's her for, hard for her to talk about. There's so much support out there. And, and one of the things that I wish I was a little, that I wish I could do over is I wish I was better, edu- better educated in the medicine that I was given. Okay, mm. because- Oh yeah, you were on some strong things. I was on some strong things. So like Terry Metz, people don't know, Terry Metz was shot, I wanna say 2003, 2004 in Pinellas County. And he was shot with an AK in the arm, shattered both bones, he had multiple surgeries. Um, and he was on very hard painkillers. He eventually got very addicted to painkillers. Yeah. And those painkillers, they have the ability to rewrite how your brain perceives pain. And to the point where I would argue Terry probably wasn't in pain anymore. He was just so addicted to oxys that he could not get away from them anymore. And, and unfortunately, he ended up killing himself. So I was on painkillers, really hard painkillers when I first got out of the hospital. And after about two weeks, I was like, I am done. Done with this. I'd rather be Didn't in pain. Didn't take any chances. Didn't take any chances. Yeah. So I went to Motrim. The doctors thought I was crazy. I'm going on Motrim because I don't want any habit forming things. Well, the doctors put me on Lyrica, which is a nerve pain medication. And it's just as bad as Oxy yeah. and all that. It doesn't come with the same warnings though. It does not. And the doctors prescribe you what they know is going to help you, but there's yeah. there's a lack of education from physician to patient about, I'm going to give you this, but this is really hard to get off of and this mm-hmm. and that. And so, you know, I struggle with a lot to get off some of the medications and I'm just about finished all my medications from March 12th and just about weaned off. And it's a hard road. Yeah. If I could do it all over, like I would rather be in pain than be stuck on this medicine, mm-hmm. not doing it to keep my mind clear. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that's some of the things that I would... Uh, it's one of the things that we want to teach when we do these, uh, these classes. One, like post-traumatic stress disorder, like that's a thing mm-hmm. and it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's a body's natural response. Yeah. It's, what, it's what you do to mitigate that and what, how you surround yourself with positivity. Uh, one of the things that my wife, um, you know, she bought me a journal. So, and I got it from one of the deputies that, that work here. I got the idea from one of the deputies that work here who's been involved in a lot of combat overseas. Like, write down the good days. So when you're having a bad day, you can look back like, oh, I had a great day two days ago. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife bought me a journal and I started doing that and that helps with some of this also. Because the brain doesn't hang on to the good things as well. It doesn't. You know, the, yeah. the, the rain smelled nice. I had yeah. a nice cat. Your, your brain it's forgets those things and you the keep days. the terrible things in yeah. your head. And so that's the stuff that we want to teach is, you know, there is <laughs> well, life. What are you laughing at the things I went to? <laughs> I had a nice cat and I like the smell <laughs> of the rain. <laughs> but no, but those, are, those are happy little moments. Hey, and, a couple and, drinks and, last night and felt damn good. <laughs> Okay, okay, we have different versions of happiness. I found out where the eels have sex. (laughs) (laughs) Throwback. Throwback. I'm just hoping we make the journey. Um, (laughs) But I think that that's important that people understand, like there is life after uh, trauma like this. Mm -hmm. You don't have to stay in PTSD, right? So let's take a break from the work stuff as we kind of wind down here. What do you do for fun? Certainly more things now that you have this. Yeah. God, Unfortunately, I not jujitsu. I right? miss jujitsu so yeah. much. Yeah. And so I think the doctor I, yeah. said no go on ever. Oh. Um, no, most of my friends have said, please don't do that ever again. It's just not worth it. Right. I, man, I miss it so much. Mm-hmm. I miss it. Just, I think the, the mindfulness of it, of just being yeah. so focused on one thing. It's really a special thing when you can block out every problem you have outside of that gym and everything that's going on in work, it really means nothing because mm-hmm. someone's trying to kill you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Within reason, right? You just mm-hmm. tap it and it starts over again. Yeah, right. trying um, to kill your friends. Yeah. It's all good fun. <laughs> but it is, uh, yeah. there's something so therapeutic about jujitsu. Yeah. Now, the guys that I go to, I go to Gracie West Chase, um, and Joe Bamboo Wisman is the owner there. And, and Bamboo is constantly telling me, just just come back and we'll we'll get you some light rolls. You'll flow roll. You'll we'll only roll with black You know how flows like, go though. They, they always turn serious. It's like fighting you with your brother. Yeah. Before you know it, you're, it's serious, right? Right. And so I am not there yet. I haven't completely blacked it out, but I'm not there yet. But outside of, you know, jujitsu, I love working out in my garage. Mm. Um, my wife and I and my daughter, we love traveling. Mm. Um, we don't get to do enough of it. Um, my wife and I got married in the Keys, um, 2011. We try to go just about every year. Um, I think this year we're going to try to take our daughter down there and do some of the water sports with her. Nice. Um, 
Yeah, we just love the travel. We're talking about next year renting an RV for about a month and just going out west. Going, yeah. Grand oh, Canyon. Heck, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That'd be awesome. We're yeah. going to take Taco with us also. All oh, right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Taco, I love that. Yeah. So we definitely want to do do more traveling. But honestly, sometimes a good night a good night out for me is a good night in. Mm-hmm. Have moving nights with my family and just kind of everyone being on the couch. It's sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, and there's things about life and marriage and family where it's just like, ugh, you know, but there's also times where it's like, is the best life ever, man. Yeah. I'm still here to enjoy it. You know, I mm-hmm. love my, I love my girls. So for fun, I just, man, I love just taking care of myself and swimming in the pool with my daughter and hanging out mm-hmm. in the back patio and yeah. just, just being at home. And, and taco, tacos uh, enjoying retirement. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I violate every rule of uh, owning, a, owning a police canine. <laughs> he sleeps in the bed. He sleeps on the couch. Are there any rules after they retire? Yeah. No, Not for me. For rules. Bosco, there was. Bosco was yeah. kind of like, taco, he was, he was ta- kind of a terror. Taco, taco earned it. I mean, yeah. the, that was the, you know, I was, I was off for a couple of weeks, but I came in for the award ceremony because I think it's super cool. We gave a dog a medal of honor. Mm-hmm. So. He's the first one, Hell isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And well deserved. They um, all loved it. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I thought it was very cool that the sheriff would would do that because the dogs are, um, they're equipment. They're mm-hmm. not personnel. Yeah, they have their own, right. they have a serial number, yeah, right? Yeah, an not, asset number assigned yeah. to him. Yeah. yeah. And so like when we retire and we remove that asset from the sheriff's office, you know, and so to give him uh, an award and say like, no, this dog is a hero. And for this moment, he's personnel. It's like, man, that's so cool, dude. Yeah, that was. In January, I just got to a point where I knew I had to go back to work soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And physically, I was ready to go. And I already met met with the sheriff. I was like, I'm coming back. January 16th, I'm coming back to K9. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know what it was, man. I was still, I was going, I was coming off some medicines for sure. So there was definitely a, yeah. a chemical imbalance there that was happening. It was right. causing some stress. But I was just like, I had this overwhelming feeling of, I am done. Mm-hmm. I'm done chasing bad guys. I'm just done. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's something else for me to do or to catch bad guys, but I'm done putting handcuffs on people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've done 18 years between SWAT and K9. Yeah. I've put in my time. time. I'm done. You know, and I and I talk to the sheriff. And luckily, he threw me in training right away. He's like, yeah. "You wanted it, cheers." So it was kind of funny. I don't know if he recalled how I took it, but he's you know at the time we were replacing a few dogs, and he's like, "Okay, so it sounds like we got to buy one dog. Um, how much? Are, I'm like the 13 grand right now, and they buy him in Oxford." And he's like, okay, um, how old's the one dog we're, we're going to give to another handler? I'm like, I think he's four. And that's good. And he's like, how old's Taco? And I'm like, um, 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sir, I, I would like to keep Taco. And he's like, oh, no, you're going to keep him. I'm like, gee, I mean, <laughs> like, leave with that, sir. I'm like, I'm like, you're going to need your SWAT team to get this dog back. You know? like, <laughs> like, I don't think you realize like how he said it. I thought like, are you going to try to get this talk to another hand? I mean, number one, like no one else could work him because he's so quirky yeah. in his tracking. But I'm like, bro, I, legit, you're gonna, you're, we're, we're about to fight. You're going to stand up. You're going to try to get, take this talk from me. You know? like, awesome. But my wife and daughter, they adore him. You yeah. know, my wife, mm-hmm. uh, my daughter loves Taco. She takes care of him now, feeding him, and, mm-hmm. and she goes on walks every night with me. He snuggles on the couch with everyone. Yeah. I mean, he's such oh. a great dog, which is such a cool thing about Miles that – that dog can snuggle on the couch, laying on his back, balls up in the air, right? <laughs> just, just loving life. Mm. But then the next day he can run into a gunfight yeah. and save his hand. You're like, yeah. the yeah. mouths are just, yeah. and really I don't, shepherds in general, if trained correctly, these yeah. police canines are something very special. They really are. Yeah. All right. Well, we like to give uh, all of our guests, if there's, if there's something that we, you could let the public know that would make your job easier, we give you the opportunity. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been, it's been beat up, but I'll say it again. You know, the gun that was used to shoot me was stolen out of a unlocked car in Marion County. I mean, you know, the person responsible for my injuries is Zion. But listen, the guy that left that car, left the gun in his car, he shouldered some of this, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. right? I mean, so every, you have to lock your cars. Stop leaving your keys in your car. Stop leaving your guns in your car. I mean, listen, leave your keys in your car and car gets stolen. That's why you have insurance, but... Your guns in your car, come on. Yeah. It's just irresponsible and stupid. I'm a, I'm a constitutionalist. I'm a big advocate of the Second Amendment, but that comes with some responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. And the sheriff beats it up. And I think the, the sheriff has done everything from, you know, billboards to putting the pamphlets inside cars, which, you know, kind of crazy, you know, but like that didn't work either, right? Yeah. People mm-hmm. are obviously going to leave their cars unlocked. They don't care. Some people get mad about there's a brochure in their car. They're going to do it either way, but understand that the gun you leave in your car, just because you want it in there in case you need it, if you don't lock your car, that gun can be used. I mean, there was just a kid that was killed in St. Pete from yeah. a gun that was found in an alley. Yep. You have to be responsible for these guns because if you're an advocate of law enforcement, that gun you left in the car that's no longer there, that might be used to be kill, to, to kill a cop. Yeah, you know, 100%. That's a hard thing to recover from. Absolutely. Know? I don't know if that guy in Marion County ever found out that the gun, his gun 
the load with 13 rounds of hollow points was used to try to kill two deputies and a dog. Yeah. Dude, that, That's, you, know, you know what I mean? Like you're not being responsible for the second amendment. It's a, it's not a privilege. It's a right. Right. But with that right comes responsibility. Thanks for coming on. We really Absolutely. appreciate it. I yeah. know, yeah. you know, I, we were all, we were kind of hesitant to approach you because you've been overwhelmed you've by been this overwhelmed. for the last people year. Everyone makes it. you talk about this. Which, and and but that's kind of why I wanted to do it because but, I wanted yeah. to, Give you a chance to show. Yeah, maybe. So I never more, planned. Here's the thing: than, I never planned on doing thing. it. I happened to see a lot yeah. in the hallway, and then like, yeah, like as you're around the corner, she sent me an email. I'm like, Ugh. there it is. But here's the thing: is the reason why I wanted to do it is I want the agency to know, and I want the public to know. Like, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. doing fine. But understand that, like, this is a dangerous job. But the people that put on the uniform, they un they accept those contingencies that they might not come home. Right, and really just bring an awareness that like, listen, cops are people, man, and. Sometimes this job is going to change them. Mm -hmm. And so deputies who are having a hard time, you know, based on what it could be anything, it doesn't have to be a trauma. It could be divorce or, mm -hmm. you know, finances, whatever the case is. Yeah. There is a silver lining and there is an end to that road. It's just, you know, I come back to, you know, what helped me get through, you know, the physical injuries, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter excuses, stay in the fight, mm -hmm. right? Find a reason to win and then, you, you know, and you'll be okay. You know, but and that's why I really want to do the podcast is like, if I can survive this mm -hmm. and come out on the end and still be a good husband and good father and, and, and try my best to live up to, you know, to that, you certainly can survive whatever stress you're going through. Right. But it's also okay to ask for help. You don't have to muscle mm -hmm. through everything yourself. You know what I mean? So that's why I want to do the podcast is really just let people know, like life is <laughs> sometimes you don't have to battle it alone. Mm -hmm. You know, no, we, we appreciate that. I think it's kind of interesting with my question at the beginning that you were like, I want to know everything like about the brain yeah. because it's, that's why you go get help because we don't know everything yeah. about how our brains process trauma and different things. Yeah. Like that's why you go to a professional that can help you talk it through. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's important. Totally. It is. It's well, important. Yeah. Corporal Medic and everybody. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank, Thank you. So and much. now if people harass you to tell, just tell them, to listen to the podcast. Yeah, go to the yeah. podcast. There you yeah. go. Thanks again, Matt. Before, we shut her down. Laura, you got to do your thing. Uh, we appreciate having feedback on the podcast. If there's anything you want us to talk about, any guests you wanted us to have on, there is an opportunity to contact us, and that is via uh, email. You can email us at let's56 at pcsonet.com. That's L-E-T-S-5-6 at pcsonet.com. That was excellent. We also do have a dedicated Instagram, 56 yes, Podcast. That's pretty new. Uh, on Instagram. Uh, 56 podcast just spelled out F I F T Y S I X podcast. I want to make sure I didn't spell six <laughs> wrong. What, what do you think about doing a teaser for the uh, episode to follow this one? Who's next? I think that would be wise. Who's next? Um, if let's just say if people had to guess what would be a logical follow up to uh to Matt Aiken Taco, who would they think? <gasps> oh, taco. Oh, God. Yeah. I thought about bringing taco. <laughs> you should have brought taco. I wanted you to, I wanted you to bring taco and I wanted you to bring drumsticks. <laughs> yeah, actually, but you yeah. disappointed me. Twice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We're just gonna, I'm just going to hit the delete button as yeah. soon as you guys leave. All right. So, uh, Jake? Yes. We got oh, Jake man. next? Yes. All right. Oh, hide, awesome. your, hide your wives. Hide your girlfriends. Yeah. Jake. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>